Good morning, everybody. It looks like we're all on. And we even have an addition here. We have our new Sorry, our newest member. Welcome, welcome, everybody. With that, let me go ahead and uh, want to, if I can have uh, Ms. Taylor, please call the roll. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman Vasquez. Present. Vice Chairman Schaefer. Present. Member Gaines. Present. Member Cohen. Here. Deputy Controller Sowers. Present. So we're all present. We have a quorum. And with that, we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. With that, members, I just once again wanted to remind you all, um, you know, we're all, you know, with this virtual meeting, we are all on the same line. So once again, if we could just be clear and be patient and make sure that we, when we're asked to speak, that we're recognized so the, uh, our staff, specifically our, our transcriptionists, can clearly state uh, and record the minutes accurately. Uh, and actually this morning, we move, we're, we're looking to move, uh, well, in terms of the order of the agenda, we're moving a couple items back a little bit, uh, specifically to accommodate our, our constitutional member, Mrs. Yi, who will join us this afternoon. So uh, we will begin <clears throat> uh, with uh, the order of the of the day, starting with items J, K, and then get into L2, and then we'll take a break and be a little bit of an extended lunch break. And then uh, when the controller joins us, we'll reconvene and then get into our some of our constitutional uh, duty agenda items and then get into our governance. So with that, let me have, uh, if I can have Ms. Taylor, uh, please proceed with the first order of business here. Thank you. Our first order of business is an announcement regarding the public teleconference participation. Good morning and thank you for joining today's Board of Equalization meeting via teleconference. Throughout the duration of today's meeting, you will primarily be in a listen-only mode. As you may know from our public agenda notice and our website, we have requested that individuals who wish to make a public comment fill out the public comment submission form found on our additional information webpage in advance of today's meeting, or alternatively, participate in today's meeting by providing your public comment live. After the presentation of an item has concluded, we will begin by identifying any public comment requests that have been received by our board proceeding staff with the AT&T operator providing directions for you to identify yourself. After all known public commenters have been called, the operator will also provide public comment instructions to the individuals participating via teleconference. Accordingly, if you intend to make a public comment today, we recommend dialing into the meeting on the teleconference line as the audio broadcast on our website experiences a one to three minute delay. When giving a public comment, please limit your remarks to three minutes. We ask that everyone who is not intending to make a public comment, please mute their line or minimize background noise. If there are technical difficulties when we are in the public comment portion of our meeting, we will do our best to read submitted comments into the record at the appropriate time. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Our next item is administrative consent agenda item J1, administrative consent agenda, approval of board meeting minutes for September 22nd through 24th, 2020. 
The board minutes were posted and we received no comments. The minutes are ready for your approval. Thank you. Members, do we have any questions or comments on our J1 approval of the board minutes? Hearing and seeing none. Uh, Ms. Taylor, do we? I'm sorry, go ahead. Is that like that? I think I heard Ms. Stowers. Yes, Deputy Controller Stowers here. I move approval of the minutes. I second the Vice Chair Schaefer. It's been moved and second. <laughs> Hearing and seeing no hands or comments. Ms. Taylor, if you could please call the roll. Chairman Vasquez. Aye. Vice Chairman Schaefer. Aye. Member Gaines. Aye. Member Cohen. Aye. Deputy Controller Stowers. Aye. So that's unanimous of those present. Uh, Ms. Taylor, if you would please call the next item. The next item is K, other administrative items. The executive director's report has two items. K1A, organizational update, will be presented by executive director, Ms. Fleming. Ms. Lisa Renati, Chief Deputy Director, will present item K1B, Operational Priorities and Projects. Ms. Fleming and Ms. Renati, are you both ready to present? Yes, good morning, thank you. Good morning, Chairman Vasquez, honorable members. I'm Brenda Fleming, the Executive Director. I'm hoping all is well with, uh, with you all and your families and um, all is well with our extended uh, audience members as well. Today, members, the executive team will provide updates on our priorities and accomplishments in their respective areas of responsibility. It's a great privilege to work with this team of amazingly talented professionals. I applaud all of them and the management team and our staff and extend my thanks and appreciation to the agency staff who perform our constitutional and statutory duties on a daily basis. I'd like to start by acknowledging staff in the State Assessed Properties Division the Board Proceedings Division, and the Legal Department for all of their hard work during this appeals season. There were 28 petitions members filed this year, and despite the short time frame and the challenges presented by the pandemic, staff have done a tremendous job managing this workload and continues to do so. Next month, at the December Board meeting, the Board, you will continue to hear and render decisions on pending appeals of state assessed property values. In addition to their appeals workload, the State Assessed Properties Division has also begun preparing for the 2021 appraisal season. I'd like to thank staff for all of their dedication and, ha and hard work. As you know, at last month's meeting, members, I was directed to issue an LTA that would provide guidance for AAB remote hearings based on the consensus items that we discussed last month. I'm pleased to report that the material is in process and it will, should be issued shortly. And thank you for all who participated in that discussion and contributed to that very important body of work. We'll of course continue with discussions on that topic tomorrow, Wednesday, November 18th, for the next part of the, uh, dealing with the non-consensus items, outstanding items for the AAB remote hearing guidance. We'll continue to work on that and staff will give you more updates. Members, as you're aware, the results from the November 3rd election have been called and pending certification, uh, Prop 15 appears did not pass. Prop 19 appears to have passed. Work has already begun on Proposition 19 implementation. The legislation members to draw to your attention contains two operative dates, February 16th, 2021 and April 1st, 2021. Mr. Young will be going into the specific details during his presentation coming up shortly. Once the election results are finalized, We'll be circling back with you on the LTA discussing Proposition 19. Additionally, members, as we look at implementation, we'll also circle back with you on your roles and responsibility because, as you know, there will be some additional cleanup legislation um, attached to Prop 19. Members also, uh, Peter Kim, our Chief Communications Officer, now has just about a month under his belt. 
He's jumped right in and is working with Lisa Thompson, our taxpayer rights advocate, and Dave Young, the property tax deputy director on the agency's public outreach on Proposition 19 and other issues currently affecting property tax administration. Over the next couple of months, I will be scheduling meetings with your offices for Mr. Kim and I to have more discussion with you and gather your insight and your input regarding our implementation on our communications plans going forward. I wanted to give him a couple of months <laughs> to get settled and familiar with our agency and our current communication protocols. He's also working on revitalizing our external and internal websites to maximize the user experience. So we'll definitely members circle back with you so we'll have more time for you to spend uh, with our Chief uh, Communications Officer. Members, uh, regarding our recruitment, we continue to make really good progress on filling key roles and positions within the agency. In the past month, we brought on several new team members from outside the agency, very exciting news. For example, we hired a new supervising property appraiser, an associate property appraiser, and an assistant property appraiser, all of whom come to us with prior county or board appraisal experience. Ms. Renati members will share more of the progress being made in this area in her report. Following last month's meeting, we started on the Workforce Planning Workgroup Report targeted for presentation to the board at the December board meeting. In collaboration with the county assessors, our intent is to create a report that can be used to inform the legislature, board of supervisors, state and local HR departments, community colleges, and state universities um, all facing uh, regarding the challenges that are facing our, uh, all of us, both the state agency, BOE, and also with the county assessors. We'd like to give you more input uh, as to what some of those challenges are and a course of action to address the immediate and near-term needs. I want to thank you for your hard work, members, and your dedication on this very important issue, which we started, if you recall, in September of 2019 um, at, the first, at the San Diego informational hearing. And so thank you, members, for all of your participation and leadership. Members, as you're aware, we are relocating our headquarters to our new offices in Natomas. We're on schedule. In fact, as we speak, moving activities are occurring. Ms. Renati will provide more detail, and there literally are movers and boxes being shifted around. So if you hear a little uh, noise in the back, forgive us. We've got some activities going on in the background. Finally, members, Mr. Durham and I will be reaching out to your offices to discuss potential legislative proposals and workload for 2021. We look forward to revisiting the many lessons learned from administering California's property tax system during the current pandemic. In addition to the information gathered from the board's informational hearings and on some of the important challenges facing property tax administration. This will give us an opportunity to consider potential legislation, rules, regulations, or policies that would benefit the taxpayers and the property tax processes for the coming year. As always, members, I wanna thank our staff for their response during the COVID-19 crisis and their commitment to our continuity of government responsibilities while still caring for their families. I will now hand it over to the executive management team, which includes Ms. Renati, Mr. Young, Mr. Durham, and Ms. Thompson to provide updates on projects and operational priorities in their respective areas and any questions that you may have. Members, we're looking forward to a good day. Again, I hope all is well with you and your families. Thank you, members. Good morning, Chairman Vasquez and honorable members. I am Lisa Renati, Chief Deputy Director. Today, I will provide a report on the substantive updates regarding the agency's operational priorities and projects since last month. The first item is our workforce capacity. Since last month's report, four positions have been filled. Of the four hires, one is an internal promotion and three are new hires. We are experiencing an increase in the number of applications included applicants from outside the Sacramento area, those with prior experience, and many include a broad range of professional and educational experience. Additionally, we have 17 positions in active recruitment with many more in the recruitment preparation phase. We anticipate seeing the outcome of these efforts over the next few months. Plans for outreach and recruitment fairs with colleges and universities, industry groups, professional associations, and other previously untapped forums are in progress and include actions to address our diversity and inclusion goals and to attract a broad and diverse candidate pool. <sighs> Members, the next item is the headquarter office relocation project. Construction of our new headquarters office continues with no issues to report. 
the executive team, legal department, and board proceedings division will begin their move into the new facility this week, and additional moves will continue into next week. And members, the last item I would like to present is regards to the agency strategic plan. I would like to share information regarding our efforts to revitalize our BOE intranet and internet websites. Mr. Peter Kim, our chief communications officer, is reviewing our public and internal websites to enhance the capabilities and improve the ease of finding information. It is essential that our public website is easy to use and for visitors to find the information they need. For example, Mr. Kim has updated our website to include new information on Proposition 19. The Prop 19 information compares the current law and the changes per Prop 19. This information is easy to access from the BOE website banner on our homepage. We will be updating our website to provide helpful information on Prop 19 as it becomes available. Additionally, Mr. Kim will be working closely with Lisa Thompson, our taxpayers' rights advocate, so that our website will include more in educational information on a range of our tax programs. I'll have more to come on that in the future. Members, this concludes my portion of the staff report. Mr. Young and the subsequent reports will provide more information on other program activities. Thank you. Is Mr. Young available? <clears throat> yes, I am here. Good. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Vasquez and honorable members of the board. My name is David Young and I'm the deputy director of the property tax department. So today I will provide a little bit more information on the uh, on, on the operations of the property tax department. Um, as Ms. Fleming mentioned, state the state assessed properties division is Currently, the main task is working on our assessment appeals. For this year, the department received 24, 28 separate assessment appeals. And if you will recall, in October, um, nine of them were brought before you for action and uh, for, for consideration and action. Later on today, an additional 10 will be brought for you forward for uh, consideration action also, which will leave nine for December. Um, staff is to this day continuing to work on those remaining nine. They are meeting with state assessees and our legal department in, hoping, in, in resolving and exploring issues. So hopefully all write-ups will be done, all reps will be done and brought before the board in December. Um, my next update is on the Community Land Trust Project. I reported on this last month. This is guidance the board has been drafting on the valuation and the assessment of low-income housing built on Community Land Trust property. Um, with the passage of SB 1473, it did solve a technical issue. Staff is currently is redrafting that guidance and hope to have it out to interested parties for review and comment in the near future. My next update is on actually the, the two propositions. Um, as Ms. Fleming mentioned, Proposition yeah. 15 does not look like it's going to pass. It just awaits certification. I wanted one to recognize staff for their tremendous work in preparing the implementation plan for Prop 15. It was probably the largest implementation plan that I have been personally involved with and staff, legal, uh, all departments have dedicated much work to that. The great thing about that is there were many lessons learned and that implementation plan will serve as a template for many more, hopefully in the future. So it, it is not, it is work well invested and will be useful in the future. <clears throat> the next update is on Prop 19. Prop 19 looks like it will pass. It once again awaits certification of the results. And that <clears throat> proposition is the home protection for seniors, severely disabled, families, and victims of wildfire or natural disasters act. 
Um, once again, staff is finalizing our implementation plan on, on Prop 19, but work has already started on implementing that. So staff has started drafting announcement LTA for that, for that proposition. It has already updated portions of our website with, informa with pertinent information. Um, we are reviewing forms that will be needed to administer uh, Prop 19. <clears throat> For additional work will be required to review regulations, um, review and update handbooks, annotations, and um, re-looking at our clearinghouse functions. Right now, we already track uh, base your transfers for one time with this new proposal, it increases it to three times, so we're already looking at how to expand our system to do that. And my final operational update is on the assessor's handbooks. Um, the three handbooks that staff updates annually, the 531, the 534, and the 581, the first one is a cost guide for residential property. The second one is the cost guide for uh, uh, rural property. And the third one is a um, valuation factor uh, study. Those are currently under, exec under executive review and should and will be ready for board action and adoption in December. This concludes my presentation for the property tax update. I am available for any questions you may have. If not, I turn it back over to Ms. Taylor. Members, why don't we do this? We, I just realized since we've already had uh, an update and presentation by both Ms. Flemings and Ms. Renati, and now Mr. Young, uh, if there's, let me ask or look and see if there's any questions, your hands or comments, and I see one already. Yeah. Member Cohen. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, Mr. Young, I have a question for you. You mentioned forms. I'm curious, are we going to yeah. be revamping current existing forms or will we need to create new forms? Um, thank you for that question, Ms. Cohen, uh, Board Member Cohen. We have already identified at least three that will need revision. Um, there are some possible new forms that we will need to create, but much of that will actually depend on the implementing, uh, the implement implementing legislation that will come through. So so far we've identified revisions, but there is, but there is, uh, we keep looking to see if we need to create new ones. Uh, a follow up question. Of course. I understand uh, we're going to need to work with the legislature to create trailer um, implement <clears throat> implementation language. Is that accurate? Do I understand that correctly? Um, there are there are some issues uh, so far that we've identified. Uh, implementing legislation would be one way of adding some clarity to it. Um, what are the other the other options? alternative would yeah, the other alternative always is is the board has a function in promulgating rules, and mm -hmm. there's also clarifying guidance that the board could could issue. So I believe and probably all three would be in the mix. All three would be in the mix. Okay, so um, that would that means that BOE staff would be in the mix, meet, either meeting with the legislative legislators or amongst ourselves with the board on exactly what that language is going to be and what how it's going to look. Is that correct? I've never done this before, so I'm we, I'm really asking a question. <laughs> you, you are correct. Usually, usually they do they do seek our um, our, our our consultation in some of the in the implementing uh, legislation. That is, of course, up to up to them. But we stand ready and hopefully able to, to assist in any way possible. And is this um impl this implementing language is it going to be ready by um, the deadline? I think was it February is the deadline for that property needs to be sometime in February that property needs to be transferred and then there's a deadline for in April is that right? That is correct. The first deadline has to do with the 
parent to child, grandparent to grandchild exclusion, mm -hmm. that is February 16th. Mm -hmm. And the second deadline has to do with the base year transfers for, for uh, uh, the over 55 and, and those affected by disaster relief, and that's April 1 of 2021. Mm -hmm. um, so I will I will have to defer to perhaps Mr. Um, Durham or or our legal counsel as to how quickly this legislature can move on 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 implementing legislation. But okay, my there, February sixteenth is <laughs> will be upon us <laughs> in three months. Yeah, so it is, you are correct. It is it is a very quick um, deadline. Now, um, are we? aware of what actions the Assessors Association is taking. Um, I would imagine they would be our partners in helping communicate to taxpayers this change, asking questions. I mean, they're the, they will be on the front line. Um, have we reached out or is there some kind of formal relation, um, communication happening around this proposition now that it's passed? I know I have, and staff has been in, has, has been in contact with the Assessors Association and individual counties. Okay. All right, uh, that sounds good. Through the, yes. All right, that sounds good. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have no other questions. Thank you. Chair Vasquez? Yeah, Member Gaines. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was just, uh, would like to ask if we could have, um, a presentation um, on Prop 19 that goes deep uh, in terms of what is exactly in it. I mean, I'm getting a lot of questions from constituents uh, with regard to passing a property down to children or grandchildren. And if one, let's say there's multiple siblings and let's say one keeps the house and moves in and the others don't, I, I'm just not clear on the tax uh, consequence uh, of that. Um, also second homes, if we could get clarity on that. And then there's this cap issue uh, of over a million. And I, I don't really know exactly how that works, but, um, and I, I, I think um, Member Cohen brought up great points and I talked to you also, uh, Chair, um, in the past on this issue of, you know, implementation and um, perhaps legislation that's just going to help provide that clarity that that we're going to need to work uh, side by side with the legislature. So um, more clarity be helpful, and if we could go go deeper in a future meeting, that would sure be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I think that's a. Real, oh, let me go ahead. Uh, Vice Chair Schaefer has something. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Young, uh, you were talking about the three assessors handbooks, uh, residential, rural, and valuation factor. Uh, is there uh, another handbook that deals with commercial? I mean, even though commercial has got some kind of protection, there are lots of transactions that are addressed by our assessors. And uh, I think, you know, your guidance to them is, uh, our guidance to them has got to be in one of these books. But it's not residential, it's not rural, and uh, I guess it's under valuation factor. Uh, yes, thank you for that question, uh, for Member Schaefer. The, the, the last handbook that I mentioned, the 581, is actually the Equipment Fixture Index, Percentage Good and Valuation Factors. And what that is, is it is a cost guide to valuing pers personal property, personal business property. Um, your, your question as to whether there is anything that the board issues on cost guides for a commercial, for commercial property, the answer to that is not anymore. Um, it, it's, there are now some very um, expensive third party vendor information that you could buy on on that type of real property and and um, uh, and building costs, and namely Marshall and Swift is probably the uh, the biggest one, and that is pretty much recognized as the industry uh, source for that type of information. So the board no longer issues that type of information. It's probably uh, my 
it, we have not issued it for more than 20 years. Thank you. I hope that is responsive to your question, Board Member Schaefer. Yes, thank you. Of course. I have nothing further, uh, Chair. Chairman Vasquez? Yes, uh, Ms. Stowers, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of comments. First, to uh, Ms. Lisa Bernardi, um, I want to acknowledge your comments regarding the recruitment. I believe you said you had 17 and active recruitment. Um, that's excellent. I also want to acknowledge and thank you um, for recognizing the importance of having a diverse and inclusive workforce and your efforts to um, reach out to um, potential candidates on a broader um, perspective. So thank you very much. My second comment is to Mr. Young. I believe you indicated on Prop 19 there's going to be some, there is a need for cleanup legislation and the legislator and their staff will be doing this cleanup. I got the impression that we're taking, BOE is taking more of a passive role and wait to see if they seek our advice for cleanup legislation. Is that correct or are we actively providing them with some information? Yes, thank you. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Deputy Controller Stowers. Um, I'm not, it's, it's, it's less of a need. I am not saying that the legislature must or must not do anything. It is, there are certain gaps in in Prop 19, Proposition 19, that legislate, implementing legislation should be able to clarify. One of them is, Mr. as um, Board Member Gaines has pointed out, has to do with, with, with um, the parent-child exclusion and how it works. I believe that would be helpful if there were cleanup legislation on that. Um, we have a we have our we have a legislative um, chief chief of legislation, and as to how and when we approach legislature, I leave that into his domain. Um, but staff and property taxes, we have been working and analyzing what 19 actually says and what when what it does not where the gaps are. We are always ready to help uh, lead or <clears throat> advance anything that would help the implementation of Proposition 19. Okay. I Thank you, Mr. Those. Young. This is Brenda Fleming, uh, Executive Director. Let me just uh, jump in to, to compliment what Mr. Young is saying. Yes, we are um, um, we'll be taking uh, an active uh, and proactive role in, um, in addressing the gaps that's in the, the current version of Prop 19. As Mr. Young has indicated, there definitely are some issues there that, you know, from implementation perspective, either gaps or just it's silent on it, or in some cases, uh, maybe uh, just uh, confusing as to potentially a conflict. So as, as Mr. Young has indicated, indicated, you know, we'll do the final analysis on it and then working with CAA, who is also, by the way, has formed an ad hoc committee. Um, and so the collaboration between um, the BOE in a leadership role, um, CAA, working with the legislature to outline what the implementation challenges would be, both at a state level and at a, and a local level. Again, uh, Mr. Durham and I will be circling back with you as we get more of that work fleshed out. We'll be circling back with you to make sure that you're, in, in, you're in, informed and involved in the process, but we will absolutely be taking a proactive role. It matters in terms of you know, how, how we can successfully in, uh, implement this proposition. So I just want to compliment what Mr. Young has provided you. Thank you, Ms. Fleming. I appreciate the clarification. I just wanted to make sure that we are being um, taking an active role and we're not sitting and waiting for someone to come to us. I have all the confidence Absolutely. that that your staff and CAA um, will work closely together in resolving any of the issues. Thank you. Members, you know, uh, <clears throat> when this prop first came up, Prop 19, and I started looking at it, uh, I realized that, you know, there was some real implications, especially for those folks, you know, whether it's your parents, your grandparents, or even friends, relatives that you may know that have property as they pass it on, uh, I think it has some very serious implications. 
um, for the as they transfer property, even within your family. So I had a conversation. I happened to bump into um, Senator Hertzberg, who was, I guess, real involved with the final language because the original language uh, didn't get approved originally from the legislators. It wasn't until the leadership took it over that they had to tweak it. And in that tweak, I think there was a lot of things that really left a lot of gaps and a lot of things that I think really should be in the uh, in our really arena and within our scope as BOE. So I'm not sure. I'm wondering if it it would be appropriate maybe at our December meeting to get somebody from the leadership there that understands all the nuance of the actual legislation that was passed. So one, we understand it. And then two, uh, we create a hearing where we can have people weigh in and give us their thoughts and ideas and uh, and whatever suggestions and comments and problems they may see in the future with it. So hopefully, and I know staff is really looking at this thing now, so we could combine that and hopefully come up with some good recommendations as the legislator begins to look or weigh in on some cleanup language. Because I think, remember Cohen, you mentioned, I think you hit it on the nail, you know, February the, is right around the corner. And if we don't get on this thing now, I'd hate to see us in the position, you know, when February rolls around, they're putting out cleanup language that really, I don't think makes an impact to uh, some of the issues and concerns that maybe we may be raising or looking at. Mr. Chair, I'm curious to know, do we know how the um, constitutional amendment went forward, what the process was? Um, and I guess I'm speaking to you, but through through you, but to the to the staff, maybe Mr. Durham or Mr. Young might know how the constitutional Correct. amendment uh, went forward. Yes, this is Mark Durham. Uh, I'm Mark. Over legislation research. Good morning. So this, this uh, ACA 11 started off as ACA 11. And uh, this is one of the bills that was included in SB 300. I think there were five bills. Um, it was being pushed up against the timeline that the Secretary of State needed it to qualify for the uh, the ballot measure. And this is one of the five bills that uh, SB 300 extended that I believe it was a week to get this um, into um, onto the ballot measure. And um, I have reached out. I did reach out to the legislature back in July talking about ACA 11. And uh, there's been quite a bit of analysis on ACA 11. Um, when you look at uh, the website, um, a lot of the committees did the analysis. We did our analysis on it. So um, there's a lot of the issues that uh, that you're bringing up today that are great issues that have been brought up. And uh, these are the issues that we're going to be looking through. And we did say that once uh, we would see if this would pass, we're not taking a passive stance on this, but we we have uh, you know, been talking internally here about Prop 19. So um, I will be reaching out to the legislature um, fairly soon, if not this week, probably next week, uh, to talk about this. They do reconvene in December 7th, so uh, that's another constraint that we have. But um, that's how um, Prop 19 came about. It came about as ACA 11, and then it was pushed through on SB 300. So do we need to get any um, opinion on how we can use our, we have the meaning our, meaning the Board of Equalization, how we can use our constitutional authority um, to exercise our responsibility in assisting in, a, in the addressment and in, in assisting addressing some of these challenges? I don't want to leave the legislature to do our job for us. I want to make sure that we're at the forefront, front and center. Um, working with them is there so i guess mr danjal maybe might be pivoting to you is there any um question about our constitutional authority in working on this piece of legislation implementing it miss cohen this is brenda fleming executive director no there's not and that's part of the body of work that we're looking at now um and i think i mentioned in my comments before uh, we were first, you know, going through and finalizing our examination of the legislation. So we really can call out, you know, our proactive role clearly. And our proactive role includes what we can do, including the, you, you as members, as, as a board, um, to jump in and, and, and offer that this is our area of responsibility um, to, as part of the, 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 the implementation work. 
So we absolutely will identify um, the specifics that the board can do, um, looking again for your leadership, if that means, you know, more public hearings, et cetera. My caution about the public hearings is it's a short turnaround time between, as you've indicated, between now and February. So we want to be timely with our response. Um, but over the next uh, the next uh, in a week or so, we will definitely be finalizing our work. And as Mr. Durham has indicated, reaching out to the legislature, some conversations are already starting, again, acknowledging what the CAA is doing on that end and using all of our resources to engage them to make sure that this is successfully implemented. So we will um, circle back with you guys with specifics as to what we think, you know, what we our recommendations for how you can proceed. Um, and again, it will be up to the board to decide if you want to proceed with, you know, at least one public hearing, perhaps to get a little bit more of the information, be that December or January. Um, we're just sensitive to the time frame on it. So whatever we do, we'll be doing it quickly and absolutely right. will engage you. Thank you. I appreciate that. This is, uh, this is Chief Counsel Henry Nanjo. I concur with Ms. Um, Fleming's uh, description. Thank you. Uh, Members are, oh, Member Gaines. Yeah, if I could, thank you, uh, Chair Vasquez. It, just want to reiterate, and I think everybody's expressing pretty much the same thing, but how critical it is that uh, we get this right. Um, we're talking about an estimated 55 to 65,000 transactions a year uh, that fall into these categories, whether it's property, a home being passed down to children, uh, or a second home, uh, or a home valued over a million dollars. So um, we need to. Um, stay on it and stay in front of it, as Member Cohn was saying. And uh, Tony, um, your engagement with the legislature, I think, is spot on. So, uh, And I, I love the idea of addressing this next month, so we're on top of it. One more, one more uh, point um, to piggyback off what Mr. Gaines just said. Uh, we also should be, I, I don't know if Mr. Gaykel is online. Um, I'm curious to hear what uh, C CAA has to say what their lens is. I, I don't know, perhaps their legislative committee has been engaging on this piece of legislation already. Um, do, do we know if he's on the call? If not, check. if not, we could make time to bring him, to agendize him next month um, uh, to Mr. Gaines's point to, to talk, and Ms. Stowers's point, <laughs> to talk about um, you know where we are because we don't want to get left behind because quite honestly um what is this this is already november we've got a december meeting uh then there's just january legislation goes in, in into effect mid-february i mean like it's a very tight timeline we possibly might even consider having additional meetings added to our agenda just so that we can meet um the urgency of the legislation thank you and i'm i'm just oh, I'm, I'm sorry i'm done Go ahead. Okay. Member Stowers? Yes, I just wanted to uh, respond to um, Member Cohen's comment about whether or not the CAA has been engaged on, on this issue. And I can say um, they have been. Um, the assessors yes. are also members of the Controller's Tax Committee. And they had a meeting on this particular, it was on their agenda a month or two ago with the assessor speaking on it. Um, our Honorable, um, Ms. Gosh, I'm brain cramp. What's the assessor um, Davis uh, uh, spoke on Leslie the issue Davis. along with along with other collectors? With so they are looking, they are aware of the issues and working. So just to let you know that they have been involved, they have been engaged. They have been. Thank you, Deputy Controller Sowers. This is Brenda Fleming and Executive Director. Uh, CAA, in fact, has formed an ad hoc committee. Um, and so we have been engaged with, uh, as Dave indicated, Mr. Young indicated before, we've been engaged with some discussions with him for, for a, a little bit here. So uh, Mr. Gakel is in fact on the line, I believe he's on the public line today, um, but on his behalf, um, he does want to just acknowledge to, uh, to the members that uh, indeed CAA has formed an ad hoc committee and are actively engaged, proactively engaged with the legislature and with us. So we definitely are collaborating on it. Um, and to your point, uh, we're not we're not uh, have no intention of slumbering and moving slowly as it relates to the operative date um, here. So we've done um, some good work with the assessors to identify kind of line by line analysis of you know what it's what the legislation or the proposition does and where those gaps are. So we are definitely are partnering. Give us uh, if you don't mind, give us a little time to to finalize our plan to present back to you, um, mm -hmm. and then we can get our our our, our direction going from there. I'm wondering if we're able to. 
I wonder if we're able to hear from Mr. Gakel uh, himself instead of all of us speaking on his behalf. Is there a way? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, so AT&T, if you can identify the line that uh, Don Gakel, President Gakel of CAA, he's on the public line, if it's possible for him, him pulled up to the line. I'm not showing that name in my queue. And it's G-A-E-K-L-E, Gakel. Still not seeing that name. So members, if you'll give us a few minutes, I'll connect with Mr. Gakel and get him dialed into this line. Chairman Vasquez, back to you. Sure. So members, as I'm listening to our comments, it looks like there's definitely a consensus here that we need to move on this ASAP or as soon as possible. But at the same time, uh, I'm hearing from staff that it looks like they're moving in this direction as well. And they're asking for a little bit of time. So I'm wondering if people are comfortable that we uh, maybe put a placeholder in our December meeting, whether it's in their, our first day or our second day. And if need be, if people are prepared and we think there's a need to maybe have just a hearing just on this alone on a second day meeting, we should uh, be prepared to do that. Uh, and let's see if we can get uh, Mr. Geiko on the line and see whereabouts, what kind of timeline he's looking at. Because you're right, I think if we don't act on this sooner rather than later, this thing could happen without our really much of our input. Chair, Mr. Gable, Chair Vas you press star zero at this time. We'll get your line. Uh, Chair Vasquez. Uh, yes, member, uh, Vice Chair Schaefer, go ahead. Uh, you know, the legislature is going to reconvene on December 7th, and that's only 20 days from now. Right. And if we're going to get something on our December docket, uh, uh, to, so we can get it to them promptly. Uh, we have to have 10 days advance time on that. Uh, it looks to me like, uh, you know, we're going to have to burn some midnight oil here. We may have to. <laughs> I think they're trying to get uh, Mr. Gakel on the line. Let's see if he's there. Mr. Gakel, your line is open. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, this is Don Gakel. Yeah, I, I didn't get the uh, instructions for the co-host line this morning, so I, I was listening in on the public line. But uh, yes, um, uh, and uh, for the public, this is Don Gakel, Stanislaus County Assessor and uh, President of the California Assessors Association. Um, yes, uh, uh, Ms. Fleming did uh, correctly state we we're forming a uh, ad hoc committee. We've already had uh, uh, counties uh, uh, working on this, and those will be the members of the ad hoc committee, uh, generated a number of questions uh, regarding uh, implementation and, uh, and how uh, the parent-child exclusion and uh, other measures will be handled. Um, and, in, and in particular, there is also some um, definitions that need to take place on the um, uh, definitions of uh, family farm and other things that are included in the proposition. Uh, so yes, we've been uh, actively engaged on it and uh, ready to work with uh, uh, BOE and the legislature and all interested parties to, to make sure that the uh, that imp any implementing legislation uh, is done uh, uh, with the best interests of administration and uh, clarification in mind. So, so Mr. Gecko, it sounds like uh, you're moving in the direction we are and, and you're looking to hopefully put something together sooner rather than later. Uh, and is Absolutely. December a good timeline or, or are you looking to do something sooner? Well, we're we're looking to do something uh, as soon as as soon as we can. Um, I, I doubt the uh, I doubt the legislature will be able to um, pass legislation uh, on December seventh, so they'll be working on it as well. Um, uh, but we do want to engage and uh, make sure that uh, 
um, we're all on the same page, um, including uh, the proponents of this, uh, to make sure that we uh, get it implemented properly. And uh, so, you know, hopefully the, the legislature is listening to that too, and uh, and will be open to all of us, the BOE and the California Assessors Association, um, as well as other interested parties to make sure that, uh, that we get this right uh, from the get-go. Chair Vasquez? Yes, uh, Member Gaines, go ahead. Our question, if I could, of, um, of uh, President of CAA, uh, Gaikel, um, Assessor Gaikel, uh, you mentioned family farm. Could you expand on that a little bit? In terms of the well, the, the legislation uh, kind of uh, you know grants some of these uh, 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 mentions as part of the parent-child uh, transfer uh, family farm, but it very poorly identifies it. It refers only to um, uh, cultivated land, essentially, and uh, boy, there are there is a, a vast array of properties. Uh, that uh, could be considered family farms uh, and huge size differences between farms. So I, I think that sure. is one area that's clearly going to have to be defined. Yeah, that's a uh, by the legislature concern, particularly in my district. Uh, would that include a home on cultivated land or adjacent to? Or well, it doesn't mention that, so yeah. I, I I don't know. That's something else that's going to have to be clarified. Very well. It, it, it actually uh, it kind of equates it to um, to the uh, home, but it doesn't actually say that in in a description of family farm. So, okay. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, area there that needs to be clarified. Yeah, I look forward to hearing clarification on that issue too. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Member Cohen, go ahead. Thank you. As I recall, the California Realtors Association um, indi indicated in a meeting that I attended um, um, that was, I think it was held by CAA, if I'm not mistaken, Don, correct me if I'm wrong. Anyway, you, um, they pointed out that the cleanup legislation was going to move forward uh, in the next legislative cycle. And I think if I heard correctly, um, Mr. Durham said that they are reconvening December 17th. Is that right, Mr. Durham? December 7th. 7th, okay. So we may want to consider partnering with the appropriate committees um, in the legislature and hosting a hearing uh, on this matter. I'm just concerned that December, us coming together to talk about this in December will be too late um, and won't leave us enough time and, and flexibility to take action should we need to take some action on this item. Thank you. No, that's a good point. That's where I was kind of heading with this thing. And actually, uh, Mr. Gaco, if you're still on the line, uh, I was wondering if you folks have looked at all the nuance of this legislation, the way it was passed or the measure and understand it, because I'm hearing there's still some confusion here, even among the electeds. Uh, we have looked at it, have created a, um, in, uh, in Los Angeles County, Santa Clara County, um, and a number of other counties have looked at it and generated um, some uh, questions uh, regarding it. Um, and uh, so that's what we're uh, going to be working on. So, so they do actually have a, uh, a list of items that are of concern and that might need clarification. So yeah, there is um, there's a lot out there to take a look at. So I guess my question, do you, or is your, I don't know if it's you or your legislative uh, task force that's already set up on this, uh, understand exactly the implications of it, the way it was passed? Um, no, not entirely, because uh, as I mentioned, there are, there are areas that are not, um, they're not well defined. Um, uh, you know, questions have come up about uh, uh, when 
when it takes effect, what if uh, people transfer properties at different times? Um, you know, are they covered? I think all, a lot of that um, looks to me fairly straightforward, but, um, you know, there may be questions from other people. So, um, yeah, we, we, we have a whole list of questions and, uh, and uh, you know, we're prepared to work with BOE uh, through our ad hoc committee and the legislature to to uh, make sure that those issues are addressed in any implementation language. Yeah, and thank you for that, Don. Just as uh, for the record, um, um, uh, Executive Director Fleming, we we have been working together and will continue to do so. I think really the next step, members, at this point, is for us to the documentation that we're all, that uh, that BOE and CAA are working on, finalize that documentation. Um, to the extent uh, that uh, there are legislative staff available for us to get our hands on now, then absolutely, um, we're, we're definitely focused on the time frame of that. The legislature officially reconvenes December 7th, um, so timing is an issue. I do appreciate, you know, Member Cohen's comments about um, waiting until December 16th, 17th, which is our next BOE meeting. We, we will need to move a little faster than that. Um, and so to the extent that Mr. Durham and CAA uh, ledge representatives can get their hands on some of the legislative staff sooner than, the, than they actually reconvene before the December 7th date, uh, we'll make every effort to do that. I really think we just need to get the right people sitting around the, around the table, including the legislature, to talk about what the, the path forward is. We don't have a complete document yet that identifies every single issue and to clarifies it, but we certainly have enough of material available that we can initiate those conversations with the legislature sooner than possible. So I think that really is the next step to get a clean identification of what's, what the gaps are um, and where there are challenges or, or need additional clarification so we can begin that planning. So if you would allow us, um, you know, another week or so to just kind of nail that down, um, then I'm happy to come back to you with, along with Mr. Mr. Durham and with CAA to give you give you uh, some updates and keep you informed. But I think we just we just need to get our finalized our clean plan members um, and the actions going forward, and carve out the roles for for your participation and, and leadership. So member, uh, and and this is for staff as well. Um, do we i'm wondering if it makes sense to maybe put a placeholder now uh that would give us whether it's i'm thinking I'm thinking like 10 days out if we're looking at whether it's de you know the end of the month or december 1st which i believe is a tuesday uh and if we're prepared we would roll out a hearing on this specific issue or if not we would be getting a report back from staff and possibly uh Mr. Geiko and others on any updates that they've uh, been able to put together that maybe might be sufficient for us to have as the legislature comes together on the 7th of December. Because mm -hmm. I, I think you're right. I'm hearing right. from members, you know, several of them that, you know, we don't want to get caught flat footed here. I think we should be already moving forward and hopefully uh, with the input of not only our staff, but Mr. Geiko and his task force and others uh, that are involved in this, especially on the legislative side, uh, get in front of this. Um, Mr. Chair, it's yes, Malia yes, here. I, um, I just want to, I guess, offer that I'm happy to take the lead on coordinating this, working with staff, working with members of the, of the legislature, as well as leadership within the legislature. I've, we've already been proactive in reaching out with to them to discuss kind of take a temperature read on where they are on the legislation um, i'm happy to continue to work with you and your office as well as your staff um, uh, so if that's okay I, um, i'm happy to do that how did the rest of the members feel about that i'm, I'm open to that i'll also be working with caa as well Thank you. I'm hearing head shaking, Nani. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's fine by me, Member Gaines. I uh, appreciate that. Thank you. Vice Chair Schaefer, I think whatever, uh, go ahead, Ms. Towers. I, I, I think that's an excellent um, solution, but I just want to get clarification. Are we saying that um, Member Cohen would take the leadership on this, um, gather information? <clears throat> But we may not need to have um, an informational hearing. We could just get this work done um, 
on a priority basis and moving forward. That's what that's what and then she and then she can report back, obviously, but I'm getting an impression and I just what I will hope it is that we're not gonna um, do an informational hearing and basically slow down the process. That's right. my big concern. So I, I I agree. We may do both. We may we may just we may do no information hearing. I don't I don't know yet, Miss um, Towers. I kind of need to get in there, yeah, ask some questions, connect with some people, and kind of assess where we are. Um, so uh, you you will hear from me formally. I'll and keep the board informed every step of the way. Of course, being careful not to violate any Bagley King rules. I think then actually I think that's an excellent um, suggestion, and I can support that. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Schaefer. Uh, I'm impressed with the leadership that uh, Ms. Cohen has provided in the two years I've been on the board here and there, wherever opportunities provided. And uh, she's the only member that can say, say that she's been vice chair or been chairman of our board. Uh, I totally support what she's trying to do. Thank you. So why don't we go ahead, uh, members, and, and we'll, my office will work with uh, Member Cohen on this and, and then um, Let's see if, if there's a need. If we if we find that we need to move sooner rather than later, we will uh, put that together and work with staff and call for a hearing. And if it turns out, you know, we're able to get the, all the information that we need, just uh, with our participation as uh, at least within our two offices, we will hold and wait until our next meeting. Whatever is more appropriate. Are people comfortable with that? I'm seeing nods. All right, so why don't we do that? And with that, let me get uh, Ms. Taylor. I believe we have, uh, what's our next speaker? Well, well, I think it's Mr. Chairman, Mr. Durham. Chairman, oh, Ms. Towers, uh, go ahead. So are you saying now that uh, your office and Ms. Cohen are going to work together on this issue? Yes, if, if that's, if people are comfortable with it. Um, I'm comfortable with it, with your office, but would you mind if I help Ms. Cohen on this one as opposed to your office? Only because of its the, the issue all reaches over to a lot of other tax programs. And I think it would be more efficient that way. I'm open. Uh, how do the members feel? Sure. You no, know, I'm totally I'm open to it. And and of course, we'll, we'll keep everyone informed. No one's going to be operating in the dark, but uh, it'd be great to partner with Ms. Stowers. I think she makes a very good point about the different tax programs that that her office administers. Yeah, and and, and uh, Chair, uh, Vice Chair here, uh, uh, I think Ms. Stowers has a unique background in many of these fields that we don't, and so I think she can bring great strengths to uh, Ms. Cohen on this. Yeah, I think that's fine too. It's a good suggestion with the uh, taxing agency uh, communication and making sure we're all heading in the same direction. I, I think uh, Chair Vasquez, uh, I think if you, you know, if you're getting regular reports, uh, I know that we may not uh, ourselves, myself, uh, for instance, but as chair, I think it, it's important for you to know how progress is being made uh, between meetings and things of that nature. So in terms, I'm just thinking in terms of the logistics to make sure that we pass on any information on to the other members. Uh, Mr. Nandra, I guess whatever comes out, if they could just share it, I mean, we wouldn't have a dialogue or a conversation, but they could just uh, pass out or email uh, any meetings, notes, or, or I guess reports out. Is that appropriate without violating any of our Bagley King uh, you issues? You know, I can, uh, I will, I, we can work with through the executive director and she can, on that. yeah, and she can keep everyone abreast. Yeah, thank you, uh, Member Cohen and members in general. It's it's uh, I do appreciate the support. Absolutely appreciate the support. Um, and then as we're working with uh, Member Cohen and Deputy Controller Sowers to move the work forward, um, I can certainly provide summary reports, which can be um, provide updates for the board. Again, and then the next the legislature, as I mentioned, will reconvene in the first of December, December seventh, and followed by our meeting, and that gives us time to pull it all together. Um, and so we can provide interim reports to keep you updated, but then the next full discussion um, it can be at the December 16th timeframe. I think just having the small group allows us to move quickly um, with agility to, to really try to get some traction on this one. So I appreciate the member support. Uh, question. Chairman Vasquez, um, 
Chairman Vasquez, this is Henry Nanjo, Chief Counsel. I'll work with um, uh, Executive Director Fleming to make sure that we um, stay on the right side of any Bagley Keene issues and uh, provide guidance along those lines as well. I appreciate it. Uh, Member Gaines, I think you had a question. Yeah, just relating to that again on in terms of Bagley Keene, is there, so if we've got communication happening uh, through Brenda to all members, uh, then we're we're being careful with Bagley Keene, right? Um, I yes, guess the question are. I have, just in terms of management, um, I want to make sure that Tony was engaged in this process as it moves along. So. I don't, I don't know how you get over that hump um, without a violation, but I'm open to suggestions and ideas. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Board Member Gaines. Uh, that, that if, if we're working, if staff and CAA are working with two members, um, then, then to pro provide any additional information to one other member is where um, we would start to, you know, brush up against the Bagley Keene challenges. Um, but working through the executive director's office and board proceedings, we do have ways of keeping providing information and some general updates yeah, okay. as we're preparing for the next public discussion. So we can handle that portion of it sure. and make sure that we are in compliance with Bagley Keene, but also right. making sure that there's timely updates to the members and right. fully informed. Okay, so we could, in fact, any update that you gave us, Brenda, we could fire back a question and then that information can be disseminated among all board members. Is that would that be an avenue? So that, that, so that would there there we're going to be a little careful. So I can I can come back to you with specific because some of it is going to really depend on what you know how we're communicating and what information is coming back to me. Um, okay. But I do have the ability to keep you know to provide some written reports and status reports as a part of the operational work, and so I can do that. Just careful with the serial meeting portions of any of the Bagley King yeah. aspects of it. So. We will make those calls uh, timely, but the the intent is one to move quickly because of the time frame, the operative right. date of February 16th. But secondly, to make sure that you're informed, so that if we need the board to start to participate as early as December 7th with the sure. legislature, we want to make sure that we are able to do so. Yeah, engage that could today. involve a special meeting if necessary. Um, again, I'll work with board member Cohen and Deputy Controller Stowers yeah. to to flush out those details. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, members. That works. I think we we have a, a plan here and then let, we'll just roll it out and then uh, keep you all uh, informed, even if it's just through like an informational email of some sort. All right, with that, uh, Ms. Taylor, I believe the next one we had is Mark Durham, no? Yes, the next item is K4A, Legislative Research and Statistics Division Chief's Report presented by Mr. Mark Durham, Division Chief. Mr. Durham will present an update on November 3rd, 2020, election results impacting the Board of Equalization. Mr. Durham? Yes, good morning, Chair Vasquez and honorable members. I'm Mark Durham with the Legislation uh, Research and Statistics Division. Um, first off the calendar, we've kind of uh, said this already multiple times, but December 7th is when the legislature reconvenes. <clears throat> Just looking at Proposition 15, so uh, Proposition 15 uh, failed at a 52% uh, no's and 48% yes. Um, <clears throat> on Proposition 19, Proposition 19 passed at 51.1% and 48.9%. The, uh, the Associated Press has called both of these ballot measures. However, the Secretary of State has until December 7th to certify these results. Um, as of yesterday, uh, there were 528,481 unprocessed ballots, and I calculated those unprocessed, unprocessed ballots to see if there would be any change um, in how these propositions, if they flipped. Uh, looking at Proposition 15, that is mathematically impossible for it to flip because the delta is uh, 670,542, um, so there's no way that that could, uh, it, that's, that's pretty, pretty solid. For Proposition 19, it would require 85% of the remaining unprocessed ballots for it to fail. So that's uh, that's highly unlikely. So uh, <clears throat> with that, that's all I have on the, the proposition um, update. Um, I'll just say this one last thing. Uh, there were 14 polls taken for Proposition 15, and uh, looking at it, the uh, the support 
uh, was pretty accurate, hovering around uh, 48%. The average was about 49.4%, and it came out on Election Day on November 3rd. It came out to 48%. So uh, the, the poll is pretty accurate on that one. Um, the other thing I'll say is what uh, Ms. Fleming mentioned earlier is staff are finalizing the BOE's technical legislative proposals, and I will present those at next month's meeting where you'll have an opportunity to vote for support on those. And with that, that is my update. Thank you, members. Do we have any questions of Mr. Drum? Uh, uh, Vice Chair Schaefer here. Yes, Vice Chair, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Durham, uh, I've heard that the proponents of Prop 15, uh, having brought this up once before and this year, are going to be working on some version of it for the future. Uh, I always find criticism uh, in the actual way it's drafted. Uh, we have people in our office who have been uh, uh, for it and then against it, uh, based on our reading of the language. Uh, would there be any opportunity we might have to take a look at uh, the proposed proposition, whatever it is in the future, as to the language that they're proposing so that we might uh, be more aware of, of what it is rather than learn about it when the public does? Correct. Um, <clears throat> if they do reach out to us, which they have in the past, um, we could take a look at it then to look at the language. Um, but outside of that, we usually wait for the uh, for it to be uh, submitted to the um, Attorney General's office. But again, Thanks. sometimes in the past we have they have reached out to us. Yeah, I would think it'd be beneficial if we could uh, uh, sort of uh, eyeball what's going into the uh, <clears throat> you know official uh, documentation. There might be a suggestion we have that would make it uh, uh, more workable. Uh, not that we want it. Uh, but you know we're we're looking for efficiency is what we're looking for. Yes, sir. We're always looking to we're always looking to help. If there's any way we can do to to look at something beforehand, we're, we're more than welcome to do that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Members, any other questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Dura, actually, I was going to ask you more about 19, but we already got into that, so. <laughs> and I'm sure you'll be involved in that as we move forward. But yep. do we have any other comments or questions from some of the other members? Hearing and seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Durham and uh, Ms. Davis, or Ms. Taylor, actually. I'm assuming the next one now is K-4A? K-5. The next item oh, K -5, is K-5. K yes. Taxpayer Rights Advocates Report presented by Ms. Lisa Thompson, Taxpayer Rights Advocate. Ms. Thompson will present an update on the Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office. Ms. Thompson? Good morning, um, Chair Vasquez and Honorable Board Members. I'm Lisa Thompson, Chief of the Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office. I'm here to provide you with an update on the activities of the Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office to keep you informed. We have completed the work on two items that were brought to your attention at the August 2020 Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing and the September 22nd, 2020 board meeting. The first pertains to the taxpayer that came before the board at the August Taxpayer Bill of Rights hearing with concerns about a senior community in Orange County called Leisure World Sail Beach, where he indicated people living there weren't able to pay their property tax bill directly to the county and that seniors were being evicted from their homes. We have completed our review and provided a response to the taxpayer. As part of our review, we reviewed the information the taxpayer provided to us and obtained information from the Orange County Assessor's Office concerning the ownership structure of the properties in leaders in Leisure World, assessment procedures, and change in ownership tracking. As part of our response, we explained our findings that Leisure World in Seal Beach is comprised of a number of mutual corporations that are stock cooperatives and that people living there do not own title to the real estate. They own a share of stock in the mutual corporation, which gives them the right to occupy a specific home that is owned by the stock cooperative corporation and to enjoy the benefits um, and community services um, there. 
We further explained that because each mutual corporation owns the land and all of the improvements, homes and other structures in a specific area of leisure world, the corporate owner is assessed the value of all the property by the Orange County Assessor's Office. The property tax bill is issued to the mutual cooperative corporation that owns all of the property, which covers all of the units within the mutual corporation's areas, which can range from 236 to 864 units. The corporate owner then passes on the property taxes to the residents of the individual housing units, along with other monthly charges, such as a mutual fee, which is akin to a homeowner's association fee. We explained that under property tax law, property is assessed to the owner of the property as of the lien date and directed um, him to a, the discussion on the assessment process and our agency's publication 29. We provided the taxpayer with provisions of revenue and taxation codes that address the assessment of stock cooperatives for property tax purposes and guidance published in Letter to Assessors 2007-49, specific to reporting requirements for cooperative housing. We also explained that the Orange County Assessor's Office is following guidance and, and the provisions of property tax law in its assessment of the real property owned by the Cooperative Housing Corporation, where the parents of the taxpayer lived. The assessor becomes aware of changes in ownership through change in ownership statement reporting filings submitted to the assessor's office, which identify the specific mutual units um, represented by the share of stock and who the share was transferred from and to. And the assessor then reappraises the unit transfers in accordance with revenue and taxation code section 65.1. Annually, the assessor assesses the property to the housing cooperative owner with the tax collector billing the property taxes on the assessment to that corporate owner. In the case where the taxpayer's parents resided before they passed away, um, that would be Mute Seal Beach Mutual Number 3, um, and there were 432 units or homes on that one property assessment. The tax collector can't send the property tax bill to a person living in one of the homes in Seal Beach Stock Cooperative Housing because the person residing in the home does not own the home or the land it is built upon. The only way separate property tax bills could be issued on each unit, and we aren't certain at that point it would be issued to the people who reside there as opposed to stock cooperative, is if the stock cooperative corporation exercised its choice under revenue and taxation code section 2188.7 to have the assessor separately assess the individual interests held by the shareholders of the corporation. But that would require the housing cooperative to subdivide the property and have the map recorded, which is in essence results in hundreds or thousands of assessor parcel numbers being issued. Well, this taxpayer is concerned that the people living in the homes of the stock cooperative housing aren't being issued a property tax uh, assessment or a tax bill. The issue is really about the type of ownership and property tax law is not what allows stock cooperatives to exist. The taxpayer indicated concerns with the Davis Sterling Act, which we found as from the California Civil Code, which pertains to stock cooperative housing. This law is not under our agency's jurisdiction, nor is how a stock cooperative operates. Well, we are sympathetic to the situation brought to us by this taxpayer. This isn't an assessment issue we can help him with. The information provided to him should enable him to understand why the residents of Stock Cooperative owned um, in Leisure World Seal Beach aren't issued a property tax bill by the tax collector. The next item I would like to update you on is pertaining to concerns expressed by a taxpayer at the September board meeting that he and other owners of historical aircraft would not be able to meet the 12 required public display days in 2020 um, calendar year in order to qualify for the exemption under revenue and taxation code section, section 220.5 because of COVID closures. Our office conducted research concerning the aircraft of historical significance and guidance uh, issued in Assessor's Handbook 577 uh, assessment of general aircraft pertaining to scheduled displays that were canceled, and also research guidance and letter to assessors 2002-90 that addressed the phrase available for display to the public, and we corresponded with the taxpayer. Shortly after the September board meeting, the Santa Clara County Assessor's Office contacted our office 
about historical aircraft and the effects of COVID-19 closures on qualification for exemption. They indicated they would be working with their county council and to make a recommendation to the California Assessors Association Standards Committee. At the October 28th, 2020 California Assessors Association Conference, the Standards Committee heard recommendations regarding acceptable proof of the availability for public displays of historical aircraft when considering exemption for the upcoming January 1st, 2021 lien date. The California Assessors Association Executive Committee approved the commission the motion to forward recommendations to all assessors regarding exemption qualification for the 2021 lien date. The president of the California Assessors Association, Don Gakel, sent a letter dated November 2nd, 2020, to all county assessors recommending they, they exercise their full discretion under the law in considering exemption for the upcoming lien date and to consider public events that were canceled due to COVID as a display day. The letter was posted to the California Assessors Association website and to have more exposure, we have also posted a link to the letter on our website under the important area banner at the top of our homepage. The link is titled Historical Aircraft Owners Affected by COVID-19. Having assessors consider an event canceled due to the pandemic counting as a public display day is consistent with the guidance issued by the BOE in our handbook and letter to assessors. In the direction issued by the California Assessors Association to all county assessors make it clear that events canceled due to COVID-19 pandemic count for a public display day and um, assessors should consider this um, acceptable. Um, the action taken is responsive to the taxpayer that came before the board and also to other historical aircraft owners and will be considered by assessors statewide. We have communicated this to the taxpayer and provided comments at, um, at the September meeting and understand he has already shared this with uh, his aircraft friends and associates. Unless uh, there are any questions, that concludes my report. Thank you. Members, do we have any questions, um, Ms. Thompson? Just a question of clarification, if I could, Chair Vasquez. Yes, Member Gaines, go ahead. Yeah, on this leisure world issue. So it sounds like this uh, stock cooperative housing uh, doesn't fall within our jurisdiction. So if someone does have a question about their property tax, through share ownership, um, who do they go to to get uh, questions answered? Uh, well, I'll try to address that. So, um, if it's it's also if they have questions about property tax, um, because the the share the actual corporate um, cooperative is who owns it. Um, my understanding from just what we have read is um, the information entered into um, between the purchaser of the share and the stock cooperative. They have to complete documents. Um, and so they are aware that they are buying a, um, a share that entitles them to basically occupy a specific home and use the amenities in the community. They aren't, they aren't buying um, title to a home as the traditional sense um, you know that is typically done for a home buyer. Okay. Um, so that is billed um, to to the corporate owner, and the corporate owner um, okay. somehow you know spreads out the property taxes among amongst the residents there. Um, but because the assessor is required to assess individual units, considering you know when that share sells, you know they know how much is attributable to that. So you okay. know the the assessor's office works with the corporate shareholder uh, or excuse me the corporate um, cooperative owner um, to identify you know what the, the base your value is for each day each lot you could consider it of within that um, three or four hundred um, house you know community so they know how much market value so they track 
they track the factored base year value, um, you know, just like they would for, you know, a single home to ensure that that home is being assessed at the lower of factored base year or market value um, subject to the conditions of Prop 13. Okay, but they really don't have any recourse because they're just a shareholder, right? Well, I don't know if I can necessarily say they don't have a recourse, but they don't own the property. They're but, not, well, they have to, yeah, they, they have, have no recourse through no recourse through us through the BOE. Uh, no, there's no yeah, there's there is no recourse. So, um, you know, I'm not sure who uh, like the Davis Sterling Act. You know, what we found is they in the civil code is they, um, you know, kind of dictate how stock cooperatives operate, but. Okay. You know, I'm not I'm not familiar if they have any, yes. you know, governing body that that somebody would go to the civil code if they disagree with, um, you know, stock cooperatives. I'm not okay. aware of that. Sounds like the cooperative would have to challenge the valuation. Oh, yes. Like if the stock cooperative, it would be. Yes. Yeah. So like if the stock cooperative you know, disagreed with a valuation that right. was done on their their entire property or um, say when a share transferred, if, you know, they would be aware how that share, um, you know, that's represented the home that, that that particular shareholder lived in, if they disagreed with the value, the market value that the assessor determined at that time, yes, then that stock cooperative, they're the ones who would have, you know, appeal rights. Who pays for who pays for those taxes? Is it the cooperative or is it the is it the shareholder? The stock cooperative pays for it. They pay the county okay. property tax bill because okay. the stock cooperative that um, okay. you know in the case of where his president his uh, re his uh, parents resided before they passed, um, you know there were several hundred homes in there. So the stock cooperative would receive one property tax assessment um, for that entire property that included hundreds of homes, uh, improvements and, and that and land values. And then the tax collector would then assess, or would basically issue the tax bill based on the assessment that that the auditor, of course, would have cal calculated the actual tax. Okay, and, but and that goes, that and then, does that go to the, that goes to the shareholder though, right? No, tax bills go to the owner of the property, which is the stock cooperative corporation. So okay. they could, would get, so in the case, so like in the case of that particular, you know, property where the taxpayer that came before us can, came, um, Seal Beach Mutual number three, right. there were 432 homes in that stock cooperative um, under their ownership. And so that stock cooperative would be receive an assessment and would also receive the property tax bill yes. okay. that basically covers a, a very large area of acres okay. and um, that includes 432 um, structures or improvements for okay. the home and then the land that they sit on. So they would get a, a rather large tax bill. And then somehow that the stock cooperative would be spreading it out to its yes. um it's an interesting yeah. scenario because there's, there's no interest in the stock cooperative to make sure those taxes are kept low because they're just um, paid by the shareholders. So it is what it is. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Schaefer here. Vice Chair Schaefer, go ahead. Uh, um, Member Gaines was talking about if they have a question as a stockholder or resident, who do they turn to? Well, they turn to the attorneys for uh, the management company, and I'm sure it's in the writings that every dollar spent on attorney's fees is billed back to them. Uh, I know one lease that I happen to be on, and it sets an $800 ceiling on attorney's fees, but uh, I know I've heard recently that one of the attorney's fees for one hearing, uh, one transaction was $35,000 uh, in Mr. Ballard's case. And uh, when they hire the most expensive and powerful attorneys in Orange County and they bill several hundred dollars an hour, uh, you can't ask a question 
without getting a big bill. I once asked a question about attending a homeowners association when I was a lessee from an out-of-state owner, and I got my answer in the form of a three-page letter from an attorney with a $1,600 bill that I was expected to pay. So I think maybe we could solve a lot of these problems if we could, you know, mandate a thousand dollar limit on uh, asking questions <laughs> and, and fees. <laughs> uh, be careful what you ask. <laughs> ching ching. <laughs> yeah, lawyers are not cheap. Any other questions or comments for Ms. Thompson? Seeing and hearing none. Thank you, Ms. Thompson, for that uh, update. And we'll have uh, Ms. Taylor, if she would please call the next item. Thank you. The next item is L2A Split Role Initiative Informational Hearing Report, which will be presented by Member Gaines. Member Gaines will provide a summary report on the discussion of the July 23rd, 2020 informational hearing on the Split Role Initiative. Member Gaines? Yeah, great. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Just um, want to provide this summary. Um, on July 23rd, I hosted the third informational hearing on Prop 15, the Split Role Initiative. This initiative would have stripped away Prop 13 protections for many commercial properties in the state. Uh, board members heard presentations from proponents and opponents of Prop 15 and held a discussion of potential implementation issues and impacts the initiative could have on the Board of Equalization county assessors and the assessments appeals process. Uh, as we heard earlier, the measure was defeated 52 to 48%. Even though the measure failed, it is worth revisiting some of the concerns voiced during the hearing. For example, the county assessors worry about how they would accommodate and increase uh, the staffing that would be necessary to implement the measure. Uh, and, I, and actually, I think that's been good for us to go through that process, uh, given the challenges that we've had with uh, blue tsunami and and making sure that we have um, good people in our assessor's offices and at the BOE. Uh, the BOE itself uh, would have had to make major revisions to the assessor's handbook to conform to the new law, and these revisions can take up to two years. The California Allowance, uh, Alliance of Taxpayer Advocates noted that the initiative did not specify what would happen if there was a dispute over an assessed value. And the Farm Bureau noted the effect that new assessments on agricultural property would have on their industry. Uh, I want to thank everyone for their thoughtful participation in the meeting. Although the measure failed, it is important that we continue to anticipate possible changes to property tax administration so that we can continue to best serve the state. I know the board has been doing great work on workforce planning and other issues to ensure that we meet the needs of the future. And it is likely that something similar to Prop 15 will cross our paths again in the future. The work from that day's informational hearing will help us be more prepared for any changes to the property tax landscape. And just as a final note, we really uh, discussed that earlier today with uh, Prop 19. How does it get implemented? So thank you so much for this opportunity to provide this summary. Thank you, Member Gaines. Uh, any questions or comments from any of the members? Hearing and seeing none, uh, let me just ask Ms. Taylor if she can check with uh, AT&T if we have anybody in the queue or from the public that wants to make a public comment here. Sure. AT&T moderator, can you please let us know if there is anyone on the line who would like to make a public comment regarding this matter at this time? Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to make a public comment at this time, please press one, then zero on your telephone keypad. Would you have one that just queued up one moment, please?
line 24. That's line 24. Your line is open. Line 24, if you could check your line for mute. We are not hearing any audio. Hello? Oh, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Did you ladies reach the public comment part of your session? I'm sorry, I don't know if you can hear me, but this is the public comment right now on split row. Do you have a public comment on that item? It's not the end of the meeting yet, but it's just on this item. No, I don't know. I have like towards the end though. Okay, you wanna, we can, we can queue you back up at the end for the general public comment. Okay. Is that like your wish? Now or? Yeah, we, we will we will call you back then. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. AT&T, is there any other, anybody on the line that wishes to make a comment, uh, public comment on the split row initiative item that we just discussed and that Mr. Member Gaines just made a presentation on? Ms. Taylor, is AT&T looking into it? AT&T, are there any further commenters on the line? It appears there's some technical difficulties with AT&T, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I don't hear them, so I'm Please. assuming they're off or something. It does appear that there are no further individuals in the queue, so we may close. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and close this item, and then this actually is now brings us to our lunch break. We will go ahead and take a, a little bit longer lunch break than usual, uh, so we'll reconvene at 1.30, where we'll be joined by our controller, Ms. Betty Yi. If there's no other comments or questions from the members, we will go ahead and take our break now, and we'll see you all back and the public at 1.30. Thank you for your patience. Mr. Chair, before we go. Member Collins, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I would just like to know if after the break, if we could bring uh, Ms. Toya Davis to the top of the agenda before we get started with our business, just so we have an opportunity to thank her for excellent work as our clerk and uh, she's, where she served us for two years. Just want to say goodbye to her in a proper way. Sure, okay. not a problem. Okay. I, I, I don't see her leaving. She's still working with us, right? As for what I yes, I think it's just in a different, different capacity. But That's I guess. right, but we should acknowledge her contribution to the board. Not a problem. Not okay, a problem. good. We'll do that after the lunch break, if that's okay. That'll work. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank right. you. We'll see you back at 1.30. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. We're back and ready to start uh, the second part of our meeting. And we do have our uh, controller join us, Ms. Betty Yee. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with that, uh, oh, you know what? Uh, there was a request. Is Ms. Davis on the line somewhere? Thank you. I am on the line, sir. Ms. Davis, 
everybody already misses you and you've only been gone a couple hours. <laughs> but we wanted to have the opportunity to thank you for your service. I know you're still working with us, but in this role that you had before with us uh, in terms of uh, keeping us all in line and calling our items. It was very much appreciated and I think we have some comments and uh, from other members as well and I'll turn it over to member Cohen. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to acknowledge, uplift and um, affirm the significant con contributions that Ms. Davis has made to the Board of Equalization. She stepped up um, to be our clerk in the time when we had a vacancy and two years is a significant amount of time. And uh, I just wanted to acknowledge and thank you for uh, serving the state of California uh, in, in this capacity. I'm excited for you and your new role. I know you're not gonna be going too far, but I think it's important for us to say thank you to the people that um, help us with our day-to-day -day operations. And I know that you are really significant in helping me get acclimated um, on the board in my role through um, helping me when I was chairing the board <laughs> with um, with the script, with the flow of the meeting. And I just wanted you to know that I'm really grateful and I'm going to miss you. And um, I will turn it over to other members to say things, but I just want to appreciate you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Sure, Mr. Travis. Oh. Member Gaines, go oh, ahead. Sorry. sorry, go ahead. No, please. Um, I believe, yeah. Why don't you go ahead? No, no, that's all right. I'll, I'll follow. Okay. Um, thank you. I just, uh, yeah, also uh, wanted to um, recognize uh, Ms. Davis. Thank you uh, for all of your uh, labors. Um, and I, I, I hope that. Um, that you'll find your new position uh, to be a good one. And uh, I'm really happy that you're staying uh, within the BOE because uh, we need good talent and um, we're working hard to uh, fill our positions and we're making progress. And so I know that um, having worked with you for almost two years now, um, how competent you are and how well you'll do in the future. But thank you for everything that you've provided to this board uh, for, the, for almost the first two me two years. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gaines. I believe the controller Betty Yee wanted to say a few things. Words. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Ms. Davis, and congratulations. Um, you know, my interaction with you has been fairly limited these last two years, but it is not um, because I have not followed um, your contributions to this board. And what I just want to say about your role is that it's such a critical role with respect to not only support of the board, but oftentimes um, you are the interface between the appellants and the board and uh, all who bring their business before this board. And so um, I think the, uh, the the face that you've put on to that role and certainly the uh, breadth of responsibilities you've assumed you know, over these two years with this board can't be understated. And, uh, just very, very grateful and uh, uh, join uh, Member Cohn and just uh, wanting to uplift that. Um, oftentimes when you look at the titles, they don't even begin to express the breadth of responsibilities that come with the position. So um, job well done and I wish you every success in your in your new position. Thank you so much, Controller. All right, the chair. Vice, Vice chair, chair Schaefer, go ahead. Yes. Ms. Davis, how, how many years have you been associated with the BOE? Uh, I've been with the Board of Equalization for 12 years now. 20 years? 12. 12. No, sir, 12 years. So you were there under several prior administrations, so you come with a unique experience as to different boards and how we do things. Uh, that's very impressive. My staff has wanted me to thank you for how well you've done your job during the two years I've been on the board and made it so much easier for us to function. And uh, I was a new kid on the block uh, coming to the board and in uh, 2019. And uh, I appreciate all you've done and hope we'll be able to see you in your other capacity from time to time. Thank you so much, sir. 
Mr. Chairman, if I may just say a couple of words. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank our immediate past chair, uh, Malia Cohen, our current chair, um, Vasquez, all of our current board members, including our, um, with um, Betty Yee here as well. Thank you so much. I want to give a special thank you to our executive director, Brenda Fleming, and our chief of legal, Henry Nanjo, for um, just having confidence in me in, um, in order to um, bring forth the words that the chair, that the clerk speaks um, in the script. I just wanted to say thank you to the, all of the board proceedings division for helping um, ensure that we kept the ship um, going. Um, and also legal as well. They've been instrumental in ensuring that um, the meetings went off with that very seamless. And I just wanted to say um, also thank you to Deputy Controller Sowers, um, who was also very helpful in ensuring that I stayed on track um, throughout the meeting. So thank you again for your kind words. I'm not leaving. Um, I will still be with the Board of Proceedings Division, um, but I, I definitely thank you for um, acknowledging the hard work over the past two years. So thank you so much for this moment. No, thank you. And, and members, if I may, this again. is Brenda Fleming, Executive Director. Um, I just wanted to weigh in just to acknowledge um, Ms. Davis, um, who has just been um, another one of our superheroes. And just for the record, Ms. Toy is not leaving us. <laughs> She's still on deck with us. Um, we are just uh, trying to, to do some realignment. Toya will definitely still be um, front and center in a lot of our activities. So again, just wanted to publicly acknowledge, join you in your acknowledgement of the great work, uh, Ms. Toya, that you've done. You know how much I appreciate you professionally and personally. So kudos to all that you've done, but there's so many um, good things ahead of us. Um, and just for the record, um, Ms. Toya Davis is still absolutely part of the superhero team and will continue to work closely with us and with the board members in our board proceedings role. So thank you so much. We're just just kind of reorganizing a bit. So, and we're very proud to have um, a board proceedings chief. We'll be revisiting the, the scope of duties for both of those roles to make sure that everybody gets an opportunity as a part of our succession planning, um, and then just really using our talent in, in, the most, uh, in the most optimized way. So again, kudos to you, Toya. And thank you members for acknowledging Ms. Davis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, uh, we will move on to uh, Ms. Taylor. If you would please call our next item. Yes, I will. Our next item is on the agenda is D2, Tax Program Non-Appearance Matters Consent, Property Tax Matters. The Petitions for Reassessment of Unitary Value. A, Sprint Spectrum LP 2720-106-4097-CF. B, CVIN LLC 8151-106-4097. Four one one six CF. All parties have waived their appearances and have not waived confidentiality to the record. These matters may be taken in one vote and do not require contribution disclosure forms. These are constitutional functions. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, I'm prepared to move a staff recommendation on both sub items. So it's been moved by the controller. I will second that. Is there any comments or questions? Seeing none from the members. Ms. Taylor, if you would please call the roll. Chairman Vasquez. Aye. Vice Chair Schaefer. Aye. Member Gaines. Aye. Member Cohen. Aye. Controller Yee. Aye. So that's unanimous of all those present. Uh, Ms. Taylor, you please call the next item. Next on the agenda is E, Tax Program Non-Appearance Matters Adjudicatory Legal Tax Matters. These matters require contribution disclosure forms. Contribution disclosure forms were received prior to the beginning of the board meeting. Item E3, Legal Appeals Property Tax Matters Petitions for reassessment of unitary value. A, Lodi Gas Storage, LLC, 
1064098 and Wild Goose Storage LLC 0195-0164099. All parties have waived their appearances and have not waived confidentiality to the record. This is a constitutional function. This matter will be presented by Ms. Garrett. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Good afternoon, Chairman Vasquez and honorable members of the board. As Ms. Taylor indicated, my name is Sarah Garrett and I am the appeals attorney for the State Board of Equalization. I serve as the neutral fact finder on behalf of the board in the cases before you. Um, today, as you'll see from the agenda, I've submitted seven summary decisions for your consideration. And as Ms. Taylor noted, we are beginning today with the consolidated petitions for Lodi Gas Storage LLC and Wild Goose Storage LLC. In this consolidated petition, each petitioner is owned by a common parent company. Additionally, both are gas storage facilities who have filed a petition based on the same core issue, whether SAPD fully accounted for the appropriate amount of economic obsolescence within petitioner's 2020 board adopted unitary value. Within the context of the appeal, SAPD is recommending two adjustments. The first adjustment is related to the market value of their pad gas. Second, um, the second adjustment is related to the additional cost of regulatory compliance specific to the petitioners after the Aliso Canyon gas leak incident. Based on the written record, and as reflected in greater detail within my summary decision, I am recommending the board grant the consolidated petitions in part consistent with the SAPD's recommended adjustments and deny the consolidated petitions as to all other contentions. The two adjustments SAPD has recommended are supported by the evidentiary record of the consolidated cases. Petitioner has provided insufficient evidence as to all other issues raised. I ask for the board's adoption of my recommendation. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Uh, members, are there any questions of the staff? Uh, Vice Chair, I would so move. It's been moved by the Vice Chair. I will second that. Is there any comments or questions? Seeing and hearing none, I will ask Ms. Taylor to call the roll. Certainly. Chairman Vasquez? Aye. Vice Chair Safer? Aye. Member Gaines? Aye. Member Cohen? Aye. Controller Yee? Aye. So that's unanimous of all those present. Uh, with that, Ms. Taylor, if you would please call the next item. Thank, uh, you. thank you, Chairman. Can I make one comment before we move on? Oh, yes. Uh, I just Go wanted ahead. to note that this, this thank you. Um, this matter is subject to Section 40. So um, just based on that, I will return in January with a written decision reflecting the decision of this board um, on this matter for your review and approval to publish that decision to the board's website. So this matter will come back then in January. Thank you. Okay. Next on the agenda is E, tax program non-appearance matters, adjudicatory legal tax matters. These matters require contribution disclosure forms. Contribution disclosure forms were received prior to the beginning of the board meeting. Item three, legal appeals, property tax matters, petitions for reassessment of unitary value, B, Cal Nev Pipeline, LLC, 0402-1064110 and C, SFPPLP 0461-1064111. All parties have waived their appearances and have not waived confidentiality to the record. This is a constitutional function. This matter will be presented by Ms. Garrett. Thank you again, Ms. Taylor. Uh, Chairman Vasquez and honorable members of the board, uh, moving on to these two petitions. Um, while they are two separate petitions before you, these two petitioners are owned by a common parent company, are both interstate common carrier pipelines, and have each raised the same four issues within their petitions. Accordingly, I'll provide a, a brief overview of these two cases together. 
So the four issues raised within each of these petitions relate to whether SAPD correctly calculated the basic capitalization rate used within the income approach to value. Here, while SAPD has not agreed to any specific issue petitioner has raised, SAPD is recommending a cap rate adjustment to recognize differences between the board's 2020 capitalization rate study sample and each petitioner. Based on the written record and as reflected in greater detail within each of my summary decisions, I am recommending the board grant each of these petitions in part, adopting the state assessed properties division's recommended adjustment to the cap rate and deny the petitions as to, eat, as to all the other contentions. Um, I would note each of the four issues raised um, within each petition boil down to appraisal judgment. In the absence in, of an error in the application of the law or an appraisal principle, SAPD's appraisal judgment is granted great deference under the law. In each of these cases, petitioner has not provided any evidence to show that SAPD erred as a matter of law or in application of any of the appraisal principles at issue. In light of this, I found SAPD's recommendation to be a particularly fair way to address the concerns each petitioner raised. With that, I would ask for the board's adoption of my recommendation in each of these two petitions. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Uh, members, are there any questions? I'd like to make a motion to approve. Vice Chair Schaefer, I second. It's been moved by Member Gaines and second by our Vice Chair Schaefer. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, uh, Ms. Taylor, if you would please call the roll. Certainly. Chairman Vasquez. Aye. Vice Chair Schaefer. Aye. Member Gaines. Aye. Member Cohen. Aye. Controller Yee. Aye. That's unanimous of all those present. Ms. Taylor, if you would please call the next item. Yes, the next item on the agenda is E, tax program non-appearance matters adjudicatory legal tax matters. These matters require contribution disclosure forms. Contribution disclosure forms were received prior to the beginning of the board meeting. Item E3, D, E, and F, legal appeals, property tax matters, petitions for reassessment of unitary value. D, AES, Redondo Beach, LLC, 1101-1064-113. E, AES, Alamitos Energy, LLC, 1166-1064-113. AES Huntington Beach Energy LLC 1161064115 All parties have waived their appearances and have not waived confidentiality to the record. This is a constitutional function. This matter will be presented by Ms. Garrett. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Chairman Vasquez and honorable members of the board, we'll now move on to our next three petitions. Um, while the three um, petitions before you are separate petitions, petitioners are also all owned by a common parent company. All three are electric generation facilities and are cases in which the parties have reached an agreement after the appeals conference. For AES Redondo Beach, petitioner's facility was still in operation as of the lean date, but in the process of winding down. Based on the 2020 board adopted unitary value, petitioner initially raised two issues. The primary issue in the case centered upon whether the further adjustment for remediation and closing expenses was warranted. At the appeals conference, we discussed the data gap, which the petitioner addressed with a supplemental submission at my request. Based on the evidence provided, SAPD recommended an adjustment to reflect additional closing and remediation expenses. Petitioner has agreed to the adjustment in resolution of the petition. As to AES Alamitos Energy, and Huntington Beach Energy. Both of the state assessees were assessed based on construction work in progress as of the lien date. The primary issue in each case was whether SAPD made a sufficient adjustment to reflect the amount of non-taxable embedded software within each electric generation facility. To support their claim, petitioners submitted a draft study which examined the value of the embedded software within each of their electric generation facilities. 
At the appeals conference, I requested the final study be provided to SAPD, along with some additional data to substantiate petitioner's claims. Petitioners provided the final study and a supplemental data um, to support their claims, which SAPD promptly reviewed, um, resulting in an additional recommended adjustment. Both AES Alamitos Energy and Huntington Beach Energy have agreed with SAPD's recommended adjustment as a resolution to each petition. As the appeals attorney, I reviewed the arguments and evidence put forth by the parties. Based on the written record and as reflected in greater detail within each of my summary decisions, I am recommending the board grant these three petitions, adopting the agreed to value. I ask for the board's adoption of my recommendations. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. <clears throat> Are there any questions of Ms. Garrett or staff? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have a question. Yes, go ahead. Please, let Malia um, thank you. Um, I don't recall um, if this is the first time we've seen um, a request for adjustments to um, for embedded software in the in the value indicator calculation. Um, I, I just wanted to kind of get a sense of whether this is a new issue or whether it's one that we've been kind of grappling with and finally have reached a, an approach for how we would uh, make adjustment for it. Thank you for that question, Controller Yee. Um, as I briefly addressed in my summary decisions, um, the department has um, sort of come up with a calculation based on a survey of um, what is common for electric generation facilities um, and has provided sort of a, a general calculated amount um, that is applied um, as a default. But with, um, I would say, increased technological advances um, this is the first time we have seen a petitioner um, allege that there are additional costs that are not adequately covered by that <laughs> adjustment. Um, and in this case, the, the data supported that. Um, so both SAPD and myself found that additional adjustment to be warranted in these cases. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Um, and I only raise it, Mr. Chairman, because this board has struggled with, um, you know, kind of the valuation of embedded software since we have, you know, kind of um, software. Ms. Controller, I think you're muted. You might have hit your mute button. Sorry about that. Um, oh. I only asked the question. I appreciate that. Um, and thank you, Ms. Garrett, for the response. Uh, I raised the question only because uh, the issue of embedded software has become uh, has been a longstanding issue for our county assessors about uh, how to value it. Uh, we see this kind of software in almost all properties um, uh, that we that uh, our taxpayers are, are dealing with. And so I was just curious about how uh, the adjustment was made, whether there was an actual upfront valuation of the software or whether it was uh, more to Ms. Garrett's point about almost kind of backing into it uh, you know, by default. So, um, but I think we're gonna see more and more of uh, these kinds of issues uh, come before us as we see technology in almost every kind of property we're dealing with. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the members? I will move approval of the of the items, Mr. Chairman. Second. It's been, it's been moved by the controller and second by Member Gaines. Hearing and seeing no other comments or questions, I will ask Ms. Taylor to please call the roll. Chairman Vasquez. Aye. Vice Chair Schaefer. Aye. Member Gaines? Aye. Member Cohn? Aye. Controller Yee? Aye. So that's unanimous of all those present. Uh, Ms. Taylor, if you please call the next item. Next on the agenda is E, Tax Program Non-Appearance Matters Adjudicatory Legal Tax Matters. These matters require contribution disclosure forms. Contribution disclosure forms were received prior to the beginning of the board meeting. Item E3G, legal appeals, property tax matters, petitions for reassessment of unitary value. Crimson California Pipeline LP 0490 All parties have waived their appearances and have not waived confidentiality to the record. This is a constitutional function. This matter will be presented by Ms. Garrett. 
Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Chairman Vasquez and members of the board, we will now move on to our last petition before you today. Um, here, the petitioner is a common carrier crude oil pipeline that operates in California. Petitioner raised three primary issues with its 2020 board adopted unitary value. SAPD reviewed the arguments and evidence submitted in support of petitioner's contention and has recommended an adjustment to the weighting of the income and cost approach value indicators. As the appeals attorney, I reviewed the arguments and evidence put forth by the parties, and I am recommending adopting the adjustment recommended by SAPD and denying the petition as to all other issues. The recommendation is appropriate and is supported by the law and the facts in the case. Additionally, petitioner has provided insufficient evidence as to all other issues raised. As for the board's adoption of my recommendation. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Uh, members, do we have any questions for the staff? No questions, Mr. Chairman, but I would uh, move the recommendation. <clears throat> it's been moved by their controller. I would I go ahead and second. Oh, and Vice Chair Schaefer, I is check. that second? Seeing and hearing no other comments or questions, I will ask Ms. Taylor to please call the roll. Yes, Chairman Vasquez. Aye. Vice Chair Schaefer. Aye. Member Gaines. Aye. Member Cohen. Aye. Controller Yee. Aye. So that's unanimous of all those present. Uh, with that, let me have Ms. Taylor call the next item. Thank you, Chairman. The next item on the agenda is item one, board governance continued. Proposed amendments of the board members governance policy, mission statement and commitment to strong governance based on annual review and subsequent board discussion for possible changes. Mr. Nanjo, chief counsel for the board of equalization will be facilitating the discussion. Mr. Nanjo. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Uh, Henry Nanjo, Chief Counsel, Board of Equalization, um, Chairman Vasquez, Vice Chairman uh, Schaefer, uh, Honorable Members, Controller Yee. Uh, this, I've been asked to facilitate the discussion of the governance policy. As you may remember, the governance policy has come up uh, on a number of um, occasions. Uh, last month, uh, I believe the changes that are attached to the PAN uh, for this meeting uh, was briefly discussed by the chairman. Um, again, to refresh everyone's recollections, what we have attached to the PAN is a document which shows um, changes by various members to the governance policy. Um, I have been asked by the chairman uh, upon a request by Controller Yee to uh, take things a little out of order. So, um, Chairman Vasquez, uh, let me know if you'd like me to proceed or if you'd like to make any comments. Why don't you go ahead and then I'll make my comments after your presentation. Okay, thank you, Chairman Vasquez. And uh, just a correction for the record, this is, we are on uh, the agenda item I-1, Other Chief Counsel Matters, Board Governance. Um, the first item I wanted to direct everyone's attention to is um, on my copy, it's the top of page 14, but depending on your printer, it may have uh, printed on page 13. It's section Roman numeral eight, role of the chair and vice chair. Um, the suggested change in this section is regarding the um, policy involving the role of the board chair and vice chair, uh, whether this is a rotation or election. And we have three options in this particular section. The first is the board chair and vice chair shall serve one uh, year terms from January to December, and each position will rotate on an annual basis in order of equalization district. Uh, this reflects the current language that is in the uh, existing uh, board policy. The second option is conduct an election of the board chair and vice chair in January of each year. Um, and this option uh, was also in the current, reflected in the current version in section seven. And then the final um, option is the board shall conduct an open election of the chair and vice chair 
every two years. If there is a tie vote, then the chair and vice chair positions will rotate to the next equalization districts in numeric order for one year until another election is conducted. And this is um, the chairman's office's uh, proposed option. Um, and that will tee up the first item for discussion. Members, uh, if you remember when we discussed this back in October, uh, we brought it up and, I, and actually I just brought it up at that point is more of a just a, a recommendation and for you all to think about, you know, moving forward. And I think I shared my comments back then and I'll <clears throat> repeat them again that, you know, having gone through this uh, chairmanship for a year and I believe uh, Member Cohen uh, would probably agree with me is that after you go through this for one year, you realize that one, a year is so quick. And then two, I think there's just for consistency, not only with uh, the board, but also with the staff, I think it makes a whole lot of sense moving forward that if we that we should look at uh, how we select one, how we select the chairperson and vice chair, and then two, that it would be a two year term versus a one year term. And that would go the same with the uh, vice chair as well. And I wanted to get your thoughts on that. I know some of you uh, have looked at this and I haven't heard from anybody else or staff coming up with any other possible recommendations other than <clears throat> the three that we currently have before us and which was mentioned already by Mr. Uh, Nanjo, which was, you know, keeping the, the same uh, status quo, which basically is the rotation or two electing a chair, but through a, for a one year term. And then the third being the election of the chair, but being a two year term and then the vice chair as well. And I just wanted to put that out there and get your thoughts. And, and the other thing last month when we did meet, we didn't have the opportunity uh, to have all the members present uh, specifically uh, Member Cohen, and then today we also have our controller, uh, Betty Yee, join us. So I really wanted to get all of us to weigh in and get your thoughts and opinions and see if there's any other options besides the three that are before us and see if we can move forward on this. And with that, I'll open it up to the members. Mr. Chairman, may I? Yes, go ahead, controller B. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and members for, um, first of all, for continuing your work on the review of the governance policy and uh, for your diligence and um, hopefully being able to adopt a, a policy that we can uh, begin to apply to how we conduct business as a board. Um, you know, with respect to the role of the chair and vice chair, um, first I'll just say at the outset, um, the draft governance policy that I brought before the board with this particular um, composition of board members after you were newly elected um, did include a rotational policy and it was really just a placeholder because um, it was just a set an expectation frankly um, not knowing um, just what your preferences would be um, but I think part of what we want to have this governance policy be is um, you know to really reflect kind of the philosophy of how we're going to work together um, certainly our accountability to each other and our accountability to the public more importantly and so these policies um, I guess what I would say is uh, I'm a little agnostic about necessarily specific approaches although I will comment on my preferred approach in this regard uh, but that we'd be very clear uh, and transparent about what the process is and so um, you know, uh, and frankly, for me, I don't have a dog in this fight. I'm never going to chair this board um, and won't be um, serving as vice chair. But I do care about, uh, obviously, the transparency aspect of it and the smooth um, uh, proceedings of this board. Uh, having said that, um, I would tend to agree with you, um, Chairman Vasquez, with respect to the term of the chair and vice chair. Um, we've had this um, come up in the past, and I think from uh, it was really from the staff perspective that um, I think the prior boards have looked at uh, two-year terms uh, from the vantage point that we weren't going to have a lot of flux every year, uh, that there would be some degree of consistency uh, with respect to 
uh, the uh, leadership of the board, um, you know, staying consistent for a longer period of time beyond a year. Um, I do think the other option, uh, which to me seems pretty democratic, is to have an election of a board chair and vice chair. Um, I would say the timing, however, should be um, probably in December so that you're up and running in January. Um, it is um, also, I think, important that when we uh, have the election that um, this is something that just automatically gets agendized every December. So it's not even um, – that doesn't get, need to get approved. It's just a matter of policy that just gets placed on a December agenda uh, for an election. And um, so I think so. I think a couple of questions. I mean, the one year versus two years, um, you know, rotation versus election. Um, and then I'll just say this about um, chairing. And I think a, a few of you have had this experience now. Um, I I I, I want to say this um, sensitively, um, and that is, you know, the role of a chair is really um, to, to manage the proceedings of this board, uh, obviously to really uh, reflect um, you know, the will of the board when working with the executive staff about uh, just how to um, structure the, the business of the board in the public setting. And what I would say about that is that um, it's, it's really, it's, I mean, all you're getting is a lot of work. It's not, it's not power. It's, and, and I would consider the, sent, my sentiment about chairing this board is that you're first among equals. And uh, so it really is um, obviously a privilege to be chair, but it is uh, a responsibility. And so um, we've had two chairs since uh, this um, particular composition of the board has been in place. Uh, both have done a, a good job, uh, but I will say that I do think the, uh, the terms uh, is subject to a discussion that uh, may be warranted now that there's been some uh, you know, experience uh, by two of you about what it means to chair this board. So I think with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would say that I would support at this point um, probably an election uh, agendized in December without um, any approval by the chair. or any, It's just automatic. Uh, we would put this in the governance policy, and then uh, that would be an open election of both the chair and the vice chair uh, taking place in December, effective for the following January. And then um, I'll, I will I'd be open to uh, further discussion about the, the uh, duration of the term. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from any of the members? If I could, yeah. Member uh, Gaines, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, um, you know, I kind of like the opportunity to serve on a rotational basis and because I just felt that um, it would give everybody an equal chance to serve in that capacity uh, as chair, and that could happen within a single term. But bottom line, um, you know, if you don't have the faith of your colleagues, uh, you're not going to be the chair. And I think that would be true even on a rotational basis, quite frankly. And, um, you know, I, I, I know that we're looking at changing this to a two year time frame. Um, and I, I guess I'm willing to go ahead and, and, uh, and move in that direction um, and go ahead and change this policy on that two year rotational basis. And uh, I think it would be each, up to each of us to uh, convince our colleagues that um, we would be worthy of serving in that position uh, as chair. And, um, I appreciate um, Controller Yee's uh, comments in terms of, um, I guess you're the first of equal. So you're representing the entire board. Whoever was chair obviously recognizes that and uh, would have to act uh, on behalf of the entire board, not as an individual really. So thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions or suggestions from the members? Vice Chair Schaefer here. Vice Chair Schaefer, go ahead. Well, I think uh, our prior board, which was a cause of a lot of bad publicity and problems, uh, were a breath of fresh air as a new board. They they used to uh, elect their, their uh, person annually, and you would have the same person be multiple years, two, three years as chairman. Uh, I think the rotational policy takes the board chairmanship out of politics and just as the clock turns according to a schedule, uh, uh, we would each fall in place every 
year based on rotation. I think that uh, is one way of taking politics out of the board. Uh, I think our constituents look forward to a rotation. Uh, I think the, the staff looks forward to a rotation. Uh, I've looked forward to uh, uh, Member Gaines being chairman in an, uh, another year when uh, his district would come up under rotation. Uh, I think that that really gives us a, a uh, free of politics a way of administration. I appreciate uh, Comptroller Yee's comments on it. Uh, I didn't realize it was in there as a placeholder. Uh, I realize if any one of our uh, chairmen happened to end up having problems uh, with conduct, uh, with the law, with uh, drugs, or liquor, whatever, um, I think they would resign their responsibilities or could be voted out. Uh, we reserve the right to do that. But I think the presumption is that we're all doing a good job and we should uh, take our turn in place, knowing that every four years, uh, we will have the opportunity if we stay on track uh, to administer and manage the board. Uh, I've enjoyed my assistance to the management of the board and uh, to not have me be the manager is sort of an indication that maybe you don't have confidence in my uh, ability to manage the board, which uh, again is putting politics into it and I'm trying to keep it uh, sort of non-political so that whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, you'll have your time as a place in the sun. And I think that gives a certain amount of credibility to our board with the legislature, which is full of Republicans as well as full of Democrats, more Democrats than Republicans, but we were represent both of them. We represent, represent everybody that the legislature represents. And uh, I don't think this has to be strictly uh, uh, as partisan as the legislature is. I, people, I think, look at our Board of Equalization more like they look at the school district and as being uh, somewhat nonpartisan. Uh, I don't think there's a Democrat or Republican way to place a value on a railroad car or state-owned property. And so I would uh, support rotation uh, just because it's nonpolitical and I think of our work as nonpolitical. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Member Cohen, do you have any comments or suggestions or recommendations? Um, you know, it's I've taken a backseat approach a little bit listening to the discussion. I think that there was discussion uh, in the prior months, the two months that I've been out. So I really am trying to formulate uh, in a position. And so I'm really just at this point listening to people's thoughts trying to glean what the prior conversations have been on this particular topic. I'm grateful that the controller is here to shed some light um, on her thoughts, having been a board member of the Board of Equalization, having served chair personally, and now as a member on this body, I think she has a unique perspective. Um, also, the author of the governance policy, I mean, there is a lot of weight I think she carries in um, in her perspective that she's shared with us. Uh, so that's the extent of my comments at this particular time, Mr. Chair. I don't know, perhaps it doesn't sound like we have clear direction. It doesn't sound like we are able to, to move to a vote one way or the other. Might need to do a little bit more due diligence and conversation, conversating around this uh, particular topic. Um, I'm just trying to understand the backdrop of everything. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, <clears throat> when I brought it up last um, October, last month, uh, I brought it up with the understanding that, you know, it would give us some time to think about it. And I wasn't really proposing a, a motion or even a vote back in October, but I was hoping today that I would uh, get a feel for you and others in terms of where you stand and what your preference is. And in listening to the comments today, it sounds like uh, there's 
I believe a consensus that we move it to an election versus a rotation. And the question is whether we do a one year or two year. And so let me just put out a motion and see if there's a second and, and if there's support for it. Uh, I would move that we adopt a two year election process where the board will conduct an open election of the chair and the vice chair. And the controller mentioned that it should be calendared in December, and I was wondering if it makes a difference if it's December or November. I was thinking maybe November to give a little bit more time for staff to be prepared and ready for whoever takes over. If it's there's a change, for example, in the leadership for January, uh, but I'm I'm flexible on that. Uh, and and it would be like I said, a two year term to see. Let me see if there's uh, an appetite for that. I have a clarifying question to that yes. motion. Go ahead, Member Cole. What you're proposing, it's a little confusing. Does that mean that the current chair will serve an additional two years, thus serving a total of three years as chair? As, as chair? Or does that mean that the chairship would rotate and the two-year term would start upon the next rotation? So in this particular case, that would be I think, um, who's next up? Is it Gaines? No, I believe it's Schaefer. Oh, Schaefer is up next up. So does that mean that Schaefer would, would be next up rotating and then have two years just of service? I, I'm unclear with what you're proposing. No, my motion would be um, that we move for a two-year term and the two-year term would start in January, whoever the board selects. Um, whether it's you know wh whoever there's a consensus on from this board and and then after two years it would be automatically agendized so you wouldn't run because i understand and then maybe the controller could shed a little bit of light on this but i understand in the past what was part of the problem is that uh whoever was the chair back in the day uh, would never agendize this uh, election or the rotation so in essence, what would happen is whoever was sitting as chair would continue for year and year and year and year after year. This one would be an automatic. It would be uh, in the governance that it would say it would be listed that it has to be agendized whether uh, and I was open whether it's November, December, uh, whatever people feel more comfortable with. And if it's, for example, December, it would automatically be agendized. So then at that point it would be discussed and possibly change depending on the will of the board. So I just wanted to make sure that we were all operating on the same point um, reference point. Uh, it was also communicated to me via your staff that we were going to be discussing this item today and uh, voting uh, in the December board meeting, which is, if I'm not mistaken, in accordance with our governance uh, rules that we do have established. So. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to hear more of a compelling argument. I mean, I hear from Schaefer that he wants to take the politics out of things. I don't really think that this body is riddled with politics at all. I think this is a non-political uh, body when it comes to the um, when it comes to the um, advocacy of on behalf of taxpayers. In essence, I mean, I really just want to hear. I'm looking for leadership qualities. Um, you know, I want to, to, to figure out who the next leader of this body is going to be. Why, why we should elect you? Why? Give me something compelling. What's your vision for the next year? I haven't really heard anything that would compel me to vote for um, anyone at this point. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Controller Yee, go ahead. Uh, I, I think you have a couple of issues uh, kind of embedded um, together, and that is one, the um, duration of the term and uh, attendant to that, the issues Ms. Cohen just raised uh, uh, around that. And then secondly, um, whether the transition to a new chair would be by rotation or by election. And um, I mean, my, my recommendation would be, um, you know, on both of those, um, I, I hope 
this body can come to a consensus around them. But if not, we kind of have a policy in place. And so, um, and, and my interest in this is just to be very transparent about what that process is. Um, and so, um, you know, the rotation policy, uh, the reason why I put that in there as a placeholder is because, um, you know, during, the t during my tenure on the Board of Equalization, um, there, the, there was no rotation policy. Uh, it was all by election. Um, and I put the rotation in there just as kind of a level playing field until we kind of resolved it among ourselves. And so, um, and, and we're having that discussion now, but I will say some of the problems that were attendant to having um, a election were those that you've enumerated, that prior chairs did not agendize the, uh, uh, the organization of the board with respect to electing a new chair and vice chair. Uh, it was uh, not automatic in terms of when that would be agendized. And, and in effect, we've had uh, prior chairs actually you know, serve beyond uh, just even a two-year term. So this is, um, I think, something that really has to uh, come to consensus of the body. And I'm glad we're having a public conversation about it. Um, but I will say, um, you know, the other uh, responsibility of the chair of this board is uh, to be uh, a member of the Franchise Tax Board, which I chair. Um, I'd be happy to have any one of you on that board. I mean, this is, you know, the business that comes before that board, this board um, really doesn't um, know politics, frankly, uh, to Ms. Cohn's point, you know, I mean, in terms of advocating for our taxpayers, the business that comes before this board, that board, which is more of a rulemaking uh, body, is uh, one that I uh, definitely don't uh, see as being a political body at all. So, um, so I'm just going to leave that with you because I, I do think that this uh, deliberation probably is more appropriate placed among the four of you uh, in terms of how to move forward. Uh, but I just wanted to provide just the background perspective. Chair Vasquez. Member Gaines, yes, go ahead. In. Yeah. Um, I appreciate uh, the comments by all the members. I, I do like this idea of the um, election, if we move in that direction, the election occurring in December uh, that would be the last month of the year. If it's one year or two years, um, that whoever that chair is ought to get the full year. And I think uh, I think a month is enough uh, time for a transition uh, to occur. So just wanted to reiterate that. Um, I remember you had brought that, brought that up earlier, and I just um, I agree with that. I think that makes a lot of sense. The, the reason I was I brought up November, it wasn't so much that you would uh, take over in December, you would still take over in January. I was just trying to give staff really a little bit more time, especially if there's a change in the guard, for example, to make sure that they have, you know, stationary and everything else that they have to do to make those adjustments and then any kind of, of uh, orientation that they might want to run with uh, potentially, a, let's say, a new chair. Uh, adequate time before they would take over in January. I wasn't looking that they would start in December. It would just I was just trying to give them a little bit more time. But I'm we're going to have uh, I'm not wedded to that for a one year term. Yeah, since it's a, a January term, I guess it, it doesn't start. Term, does it? Does it? If like, it yeah, December, December, chair, December, you would still hold your position as chair yeah. until yeah. the end of the year. OK. Yeah, that's it. That's fine. Thank you. And remember, just a friendly reminder to the members, when you're not speaking, please uh, mute your mic because then you're getting, I'm hearing feedback here. Uh, and actually, let me go back to member Cohen. Uh, let me ask you a question. Well, you know, you, you served in this capacity as a chair. Uh, what's your thoughts? Well, it sounds like you're maybe not comfortable with a two-year term. What if, if we did like a elected one-year term and then, like we said already, this thing would automatically be agendized uh, back in, uh, I guess it would be automatically agendized whether it's December or November, uh, whether they continue or you switch to another chairperson, as an example. Um, I guess with all due respect, I'm what I'm doing is just getting back, um, hearing people's, let's back up. I'm a little bit at a disadvantage. Everyone has talked about this. This with um, Miss with with the controller. I'm new to this conversation, so I I, I don't know. I, I honestly don't have 
any opinions one way or the other. So I can't really answer your question, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, Chair Schaefer here, Vice Chair Schaefer. Vice Chair Schaefer, go ahead. Um, we haven't really, uh, I want to remind uh, Member Cohen, we haven't really had an opportunity to discuss it with each other because it's a bag the keen issue according to majority view and we only discuss it when we're together in official meeting. Uh, I think there's a lot of virtue to one year term because we may frankly get tired of a member and rather than fire him or try to get him or her to uh, cut short his or her service. So we know uh, uh, the 12 months will run rather quickly. Uh, uh, to resolve all this, I would move that we uh, uh, decide that this matter shall come up for election every December for a one year term. Okay. Any other thoughts? Was that okay a second? Um. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Mr. I, I've got a question if I could, uh, Chair Vasquez, to the Member vote. Gaines, go ahead. Uh, did that mean that an individual could be elected, the same individual could be reelected to the chair position? I'll just say that was a motion, Mr. Chair. Uh, Vice Chair Schaefer, we have a motion on the floor, which I think uh, Member Cohen seconded. It's so no, 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 no. Member Cohen, I did not second. No, or she did not second it. Okay. I asked, I asked a, a question to the motion that was on the floor, but I right. did not second. Right. So we have just an unseconded motion. So I'm just trying to get clarity as to that whether a chair could continue to be elected and remain in that position um, year after year. I see no restraints in my motion. We could vote for uh, Chair Vasquez to serve, uh, you know, for the next 10 years, but it'd be a decision that would be made uh, uh, in December of each year for one year term. So just a point of order, because things are starting to get a little bit messy. Um, there is a motion that's been on the floor. It's been open for a while. It has not been seconded. So perhaps the record needs to reflect that the motion has died. Uh, right. I'm not sure if there is, I think there's a second motion that was made. I think Mr. Schaefer made one. Um, we just need to try to keep the meeting and the proceedings clean as possible, Mr. Chair. So uh, I, perhaps you can call that your motion has failed and uh, we can continue on with our discussion. Well, the way I was looking at it until a motion is second, it goes nowhere. I mean, I, I proposed two years and there wasn't a second, and then uh, Vice Chair Schaefer was proposing one year, and that wasn't second. So we're still, there's there's really no motion on the floor at this point. Or no motion with a second yet. Perhaps legal counsel, oh. legal counsel can opine on this situation. Hi, Henry Nanjo, yeah. Chief Counsel here. Um, the There is no pending motion because none of the motions have had a second. So at this point, we just have a, um, discussions of a number of motions. Thank you. Controller Yi, I believe you, we cut you off. Did you want to say something? No, 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 you didn't cut me off. Um, oh. No, I, I really appreciate the um, discussion that you're all having. Um, I do think these are, um, important governance issues, and um, I would invite, um, you know, uh, additional discussion on this and uh, probably recommend that we defer action just so um, all the members have an opportunity to really understand the uh, potential impact of uh, the different options that are being considered. And um, and uh, if, if need be, we could also ask legal counsel to come back with any further analysis that may be required. Um, I haven't heard the need for any at this point, but I do think the Discussion is robust and um, and it probably makes sense just to um, you know float all the different options so that we can hear from each of the members about uh, any reservations any one of us may have. So I'm not sure if that was a motion a motion to no. defer or to table. No, it's not a motion. It's just I think um, I, I think the discussion. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm looking to all of you, frankly, uh, about what makes sense in terms of uh, a policy to put in uh, to, to adopt. Um, I just want to be sure all the options are out there. Um, I definitely want to give uh, Member Cohn additional time to 
just um, you know consider these. Uh, I think Thank we're getting a little bit ahead in terms of uh, just trying to nail down something today. But to the extent that we can discuss fully all of the options, I think that would be very helpful. Uh, Vice Chair Schaefer here. Go ahead, Vice Chair. Uh, I think today or tomorrow we should decide this matter. So come December, we will be making a decision that will take place in January. Uh, we can revisit that anytime next year, but uh, I still think it is wise for us to decide something today or tomorrow. And uh, I think the wisdom is to stick with one year in case we get tired of somebody. We don't have to tell them we're tired of them. We just know that the calendar will take care of their service. And if we are happy with them, we can give them a second year. I have no problem with the second year. Uh, I do have a problem uh, being stuck with the second year. And, uh, and, and if we do have a problem with whoever is, is serving. And, uh, you know, there have been problems with people in the past and service of all kinds of public nature. I don't see any with our present board. I think we have a very first class group among us and we, that's not an issue. But again, I would repeat that today or tomorrow we should make a decision and I would opt that it be uh, done in December and that it be that we elect annually. Thank you. Well, listening to my vice chair, then to just try to get us to move a little bit closer to this, because I think you're right. We need to figure or make some kind of decision because technically under even the old policy, we should be agendized. This should be agendized in December and a vote should be taking place. So whoever takes on the new role or role in January would be set to go. So let me let me try let me try a, a motion that would just say that uh, that I would like to move that we adopt uh, a one year term for the chair and the vice chair, but it would be an election, not a rotation. Is there a second for that? I I would second vice chair. I would second that chair Vasquez. Okay, so now we have a motion. So now we have a motion with the first, with a, with a second. And now let me continue the discussion. Let me hear from the other members uh, what your thoughts are. Yeah, member Vasquez. Yes. Member Gaines, go ahead. Yeah. So this, uh, just get clarity of the motion. So it is. Um, are we looking at option number one? As I look at my, my draft here. Uh, or actually, actually, I don't think this one was uh, one of the options. I, we kind of modified it. So, uh, okay. So, it, is it a one one year term for the chair? It'd be a one year term. Okay. So basically, it's pretty much like option three, except instead of a two year, it's just now just a one year. Okay. All right. And then that, that's the only the, difference. That vote would occur in December. Yes. Okay. So, in other words, if it's approved today. It would be agendized in December, and then whatever the will of the board is, it would take action in January. Okay. Very but it'd be just a one year. Very good. And then thereafter, thereafter, every year, it would automatically be agendized in December. Okay. Very good. And then good. it's up Thank to you. the board whether they, for example, I think somebody mentioned whether they want to continue with that chair for another year or have somebody else do it. Sure. Okay, very well. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments or questions or suggestions? So, um, Chairman Vasquez, this is Henry Nancher, Chief Counsel. Yes. Um, there was a little bit of modification done to that motion. So, um, just to make sure the record is clear, um, the motion as I understand it now, is for the board to conduct an open election of chair and vice chair every December, and the such election will be automatically agendized in December, and the term will take place from January to December, and there is no limitation on um, the, the same person continuing in their role. They can be nominated and elected again. Um, is that correct? Yes, so he's left with the will of the of the membership. So, for example, okay, that that was the that was the motion 
as I heard it, um, which was a modification. So I would need, uh, I believe Mem uh, Vice Chair Schaefer seconded your original motion. Um, does he um, agree to the amendment as I stated it? Vice Chair Schaefer, are you good Vice with that? Yes, I'm good with it as, as I seconded your motion and the uh, Chief Counsel has properly stated it. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen, that, that uh, and, and uh, Controller and Member uh, Cohen, I don't want to leave anyone out. Um, that will be the motion that is on the table at this point. Thank Can you. you repeat that one more time just for clarification? Sure. The board Thank shall you. conduct an open election of chair and vice chair, which will be automatically agendized in December. Such term to take place from January to December of each year. And there is no prohibition from the same chair or vice chair being um, elected uh, to the new term. Okay. So it can either change or not change. There's there's no limitation there. Question of clarification. Um, Chair Member Gaines, go ahead. Um, okay, so there is some language in option three about if there's a tie vote, then the chair and vice chair positions will rotate to the next equalization district. So is that not part of the motion? I'm just trying to get That clear. is currently not part of the motion. Okay. Okay, so it's really closer to option one, isn't it? It is. The only it, difference is, option, is instead of a rotation, it's an election. With an election, I'm sorry. Yeah, right. you keep That's point. The difference. Right. Yeah, with an election, and it's automatically agendized in December. And then it's automatically agendized, right? Okay. Very well. Thank you. Any other so the motion. I'm sorry. Go ahead. The motion Member is. The motion is, uh, as as I heard it, is that uh, we will have an election in December of every year um, for chair, vice chair, terms being one year. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Vice chair here, and if uh, the board cannot uh, agree on anybody, then rotation kicks in. This is a friendly amendment. Vice Chair Schaefer, that is not currently part of the motion. Obviously, the if the it's the will of the board, you can add that if you would like. I'd like to add that as a friendly amendment. So move. It well, does uh, raise a, it does raise a question that if a if one member abstained, you could run into a situation or there's a vacancy, you could end up with a tie, and then what do you do? in that position well you you go to rotation as a in the event we're unable to agree uh, on three votes for a uh, uh, for somebody we're not going to go without a vice chair or without a chair i disagree i think that um that it doesn't go to a rotation that that the current vice chair maintains the status quo is maintained that is the tiebreaker that there is no change Exactly. That's, that's what my, I was thinking. That's in, my in, interpretation. In the event that, you know, at first I was thinking rotation, but I think Member Cohen is right on point. In the event we do, and let's say somebody abstains, or I think Member Gaines says there's a vacancy, and let's say Make we end up with a 2 2 tie, then whoever was elected as the chair and the vice chair would just roll over for another year. And then the following year it would be agendized just again. Just say your amendment was clarified. This is Vice Chair Schaefer. My amendment was clarified by Member Cohen. I agree with her that instead of going automatically to rotation, if we're unable to agree on a decision, then the status quo will continue for another year until such time as we decide otherwise. We are the kings here. Well, this Please. is Member Gaines. I would agree. Thank you. All righty. Well, it sounds like there's a consensus. Let me see if we can get Ms. Taylor to call roll on the motion and see where it goes. Um, Chairman Vasquez, just so that there's clarity, I, I want to make sure we, we do we um, adhere to a, a, a proper process. Um, as I heard it, there was an additional amendment to the motion that's on the table that in case of a tie, 
um, status quo would continue. Yes, that is correct. You're right. And 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 the motion was originally made by, um, I believe, yourself, uh, Chairman Vasquez. I'm assuming that you're comfortable with that friendly amendment. Yes. And then Vice Chair Schaefer, um, I believe since you offered that friendly amendment, you are also comfortable with that. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, then the motion will be adjusted accordingly. Thank you, board members. Can, Appreciate uh, it. Member Gaines, can you uh, repeat the motion, please? Uh, so go ahead, Mr. Sure. Mayor, so if you can repeat so, it again now. Yes. So the board shall conduct an open election for the office of the chair and vice chair, which will be automatically agendized in December. Uh, and the term of the chair and vice chair will be through January, January, from January 1st to December 31st of each year. If there is a tie vote or for some reason the vote fails, then the current chair and vice chair will continue in their roles for the next year. Correct. That's great. Thank, Thank you, you, members. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now, let me see if, if we can get a vote. Ms. Taylor. Yes. Chairman Vasquez. Aye. Vice Chair Schaefer. Aye. Member Gaines. Aye. Member Cohen. Aye. Controller Yee. Aye. All right, so it's unanimous. So now this will be agendized on our agenda for December and we'll go from there. Thank you all. With that, Ms. Taylor, if you would call the next item. Actually, we're on the same item, uh, Chairman Vasquez. The next uh, topic uh, that I believe uh, we're going to go to is section two, the mission statement. Um, this is on the first page or page three of the governor's policy um, on my copy. Um, and the change is um, adding to the mission statement using open and transparent processes and communications. Uh, There's a this... citation that was added uh, by the editor, governor, government code section 15651 comma Cal Constitution Article 1 Section 3. I don't know if the citation is part of the amendment or just a reference. So um, I will I will leave it to the board members to decide. As to the chairman chair. We can't Mike. Are you sure? Yes. Well, it's, a vote. Be, it's a vote that takes place so you can't. Nobody does that right Cody? Member, member vice chair yeah. you yeah. might want to mute your mic. Okay I'm sorry. Uh, what was the question, uh, Mr. Nanjo? Sure, I, I'm, Chairman Vasquez, I wasn't sure if the last part there where it cites the government code section in the California Constitution was to be part of the edit or if that was just a, a reference for, um, for, for people to understand where the uh, comment came from. I understood it as a reference, but uh, let me hear, let me see if the members have something different. Mr. Chairman, I think I read it as uh, with the understanding that it was a reference, but I guess Mr. Nanjo, um, I, I think throughout the policy, if we are consistent with respect to how we're doing the reference citations, um, I, I, I would consider this more of a reference than something embedded in the actual language of the policy. Thank you, Controller E. So that being said, the edit is to add using open and transparent processes and communications. So the full sentence reads, the mission of the board is to serve the public through fair, effective, and efficient tax administration using open and transparent processes and communications. Communication, excuse me. Yes, that's the way I, I'm reading it. <clears throat> Just for a point of clarification um, to Remember Chief Cohen, Counsel. Thank you to the chief counsel. Um, do you have any feedback on this particular change? I mean, I, you're, you're kind of operating as the administrator of the changes, but I wanted to hear your thoughts on as a judicatory presence on this body. 
Yeah. Um, I'm not quite sure if that's really the board's mission, so I wanted to put that out there. So this, there, there is not exactly um, um, any, any. There's no problem per se from a legal standpoint of adding uh, the suggested edit. Um, it is different from the um, agency's current uh, mission statement. So it, it would be a change to the mission stated that mission statement that is printed on our materials and on our website. Um, so it would be a change from that standpoint. But um, there, there. There is no uh, problem or uh, legal concern with adding the language. Thank you. Question, uh, Member Gaines, uh, Chair Vasquez. Yes, go ahead, Member Gaines. So I'm trying to trying to figure out the purpose of it. Um, we, I mean, we live by Bagley Keen, so do you need that verbiage? I I think it isn't everything open and transparent. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with you, and I, for some reason, I think it just came up as just to spell it out more than anything else, but you are correct. And I guess I it's up I'm, to us whether we want to list it or not. I think I'm, I'm, I'm with, I think I'm with Member Gaines. I think we just leave it as it is. There's nothing wrong with it. It's. Is it understood? I'm fine with it. It's un, not only is it understood, but we amplified almost in every single meeting. I'm good. Uh, how, what are the other? How do the other members feel, Mr. Chairman? I, um, yes, go ahead, Control. I, I I agree with Member Cohen. You are all um, practicing this. I do think um, elevating it to the mission statement just uh, suggests that this is a value that we have as a body. So um, I actually like the inclusion of it. Uh, Vice Chair Schaefer here. I'm sorry, Vice Chair Schaefer, go ahead. Yes, uh, the uh, purple language here, using open and transparent processes and communication, is that not duplicative? Okay. I mean, is anything gain or loss if it's just is not there? It's my understanding, I mean, and I, and I I agree with the controller that while we I think we all agree it I don't think it hurts us to spell it out in the mission so it's clear that's all. Yes, but, but you know uh, less less is better you know and uh, uh, you know we say everything we need to say in the uh, the black letters in my opinion. Mr. Chairman, I have a question for legal counsel. Yes, okay. go ahead, Controller. So, Mr. Nanjo, um, I mean, maybe um, an argument for leaving it out is, are we um, exhaustive with our um, authorities cited in the code references and the constitutional reference? Uh, and if not, if there are any other provisions of law that may apply that we haven't identified, perhaps it is better to leave it out. So I, I just don't want to kind of get caught up in terms of um, you know not having spelled out all of the appropriate authorities that would relate to operating in an open and transparent manner. That that is a good point, uh, controller Yi, and there are other values and and things um, in the various uh, statutes that and constitutional provisions that apply to the board. Uh, this would be highlighting um, to um, some of the comments that were made earlier a particular um, provision or, or, or a concept, if you will, of, of uh, using open and transparent processes and communications. But mm -hmm. it's really um, up to the board whether they, they want to emphasize that among others or, um, you know, or not, as the case may be. Okay. Um, I guess then I would argue for, I'm sorry, I keep switching back and forth, but I just don't want to get caught up where we haven't um, cited all the appropriate authorities and these two in particular are the only one cited, and that may be perceived as a limitation rather than, you know, kind of a uh, the you know, um, expansive, uh, which I would want us to be. So um, I, I could live without the added language. Pursuant to I'm that concern, the controller, I could live without it too. Does it? We could live without it. How does everybody else feel? If, if there's a consensus, we'll we'll leave it out. 
I would agree with that. Vice right. Chair Schaefer, I agree. All right, well, it, we'll go ahead and strike that then. Great, thank you, Chairman Vasquez, um, Vice Chair Schaefer, board members. Um, the next uh, suggested change comes under Roman numeral four, tax programs. Um, specifically, there's a uh, cross out of a semicolon on the second line after three tax programs. Um, and then there is, in that's in red, and then there's purple language that states the revenue and taxation code vests the board with authority to hear appeals related to the constitutional tax programs colon. Um, that's been added and what's been struck out that was previously there was the board also hears various appeals colon. Any Mr. comments Chair, or suggestions on this one? I'm sorry. I do have a question. Member Mr. Collins, Chair, yes. are, we, are we going to be going through each amendment like this line by line? I believe we're just going through the ones we're changing. We're not going through the whole document, but I guess where there was amendments, we're trying to bring them up and, and see if there's a consensus. I'm just wondering if there's a more efficient way to um, conduct the review. I wish there was. Uh, I'm open though. <laughs> you have any thoughts or ideas on it? Chair We've Vasquez. Member Gaines, go ahead. I'm sorry. First of all, is Member Cohen, are you finished with your comments? I'm finished. Thank you. Thank all right. You. I just, um, I'm having a little trouble tracking what Mr. Nanjo said because I'm not seeing uh, all of the changes. Uh, that he just recited. Um, I see words that are that have been crossed out. The ball, the the board also hears uh, various appeals, and then the only other thing I have on that page is the uh, the word drive, which is in red, is is crossed out and uh, replaced with support. So I don't know if I've got an older draft or what happened here. Are you referring to your governance? So member gains, uh, if you look right before the crossed out language, at least on the uh, version that's attached to PAN, um, this is again in section Roman numeral four. It's um, I have the added text, the revenue and taxation code vests the board with the authority to hear appeals related to the constitutional tax programs, colon. And okay. then there's a bullet list. I apologize, is that it? Is that in purple? I'm having a little trouble seeing the <laughs> the black. Yes, yeah, that's in purple. Thanks, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you for clarifying that. Absolutely. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Controller, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I just want to be respectful of uh, Ms. Cohen's concern here. Um, you know, I, I actually have um, some suggested changes to some of these provisions. Um, I suggest that maybe perhaps um, if you want to go through the ones that seem more um, clarification in nature that maybe we can just dispense with those. But um, for this particular section, I had some uh, additional clarifying language and perhaps for the next time that this comes back to us, if we could see the changes on a shared screen, that would be really helpful so we can track the, the discussion as we're looking at the language together. That makes sense. Let me ask uh, Mr. Nanjo, is there, um, are you able to pull maybe the ones that just need some clarification? Because I noticed on some of these changes, it was just like a word change, for example. Um, I could go over them in whichever order you'd like me to, um, Chairman Vasquez. I'm currently following what I was told was um, Controller Z's requested order of going over the document. So, um, um, and, yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and, and I appreciate the order because I, I am on a hard stop at 3.30, but what I wanted to do was um, perhaps Mr. Nanjo just go through the remaining items. We dispense with the chair vice chair issue. Um, and I think to the extent that any members have objections to the change or maybe believes that there's um, additional clarification, we just, we put those over. Uh, the ones that are truly clarifying or word change, we can just dispense with those today. Um, and then when we come back, if we could uh, actually 
employ the shared screen so we could all be looking at the, the same language and the change. I think that would be really helpful. Okay, so um, if I understand you correctly, Controller Yi, what you'd like me to do is, is um, kind of dispense with the minor word changes, such as in Roman numeral five, the um, the uh, governance principles, the drive crossed out and support added in place. I'll dispense with that. Um, just as a note for all board members, I understand I'm getting additional um, information on Bagley Keen. So we're actually, it's not listed in the uh, copy that's attached to PAM, but we will put back um, the Bagley Keen language that's in the original governance document for now. Uh -huh. um, the next area where there's a substantive change would be um, in the section related to, sorry, um, section, Leah. we're going to uh, the letter section, if I, on my copy it's page eight, but it may be eight or nine, there was an ad addition of um, letter capital H, use of public funds to support, oppose, or oppose a ballot measure. Um, there was additional language put there. Um, maybe that's a, a good place to um, go to next. Sure. Chairman Vasquez, would you like to go to H on page, um, at least on my copy, it's on page eight. Maybe yes. eight or nine. Um, depending on your printer, it may print a little differently. I apologize for that. No, I'm good with that, unless members have any other comments. This is member Gaines. I'm comfortable with that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for bringing this forward. I think this is important to have. OK, Mr. Nanja, go ahead. OK, so I'm hearing consensus. We'll leave the addition to H as it is. Um, the next section are there are a number of changes sprinkled throughout the role and powers of the board. Roman numeral seven. Um, Unless there's particular concerns, we can take that as a group. Um, it's my understanding that the references that are listed there into the government code sections are just for reference only and will not be in the final document. Um, and um, you can let me know if anyone has any objections to any of the changes under Roman numeral 7A. And that is a um, items number one through 24. There's various changes. And obviously, um, I will go back and make sure that the election language, uh, if an organization of the board language is consistent with, the, with what the board has already um, passed this afternoon. That works for me. I don't know how the members feel. Uh, Member. Oh, go, go ahead, Member Gaines. Go ahead. Member Gaines. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, this is Member Gaines. Some of this looks uh, very simple. I mean, some of it's just um, grammar. Uh, so those would be really easy to dispense with. And then I would really rely on our legal counsel on anything that might um, be more um, more serious in nature in terms of changes that we're making. But I think overall, the changes that I'm that I'm seeing are just providing uh, more clarity and then maybe correcting uh, some language. Uh, for instance, uh, using the word governance instead of government, I think that was just a typo. Uh, that's under uh, Roman numeral 7, 1 and 7, um, actually A1 and 7, A3, just eliminating the word the, so it's plural for county assessors. So, no problem there. Thank you. So, members, uh, this is Henry Nancho, Chief Counsel. Um, I would concur that the um, edits that are in red tend to be more uh, grammatical and um, clarification. So, uh, those are fine. The um, edits in purple generally are more specificity as to um, the role and powers of the board. Um, again, um, I don't have any legal concerns with any of those additions. Well, 
Well, I'm, I'm good with especially the ones that you're mentioning that they're just a word change here for you to make those changes. Because at the end of the day, this document's going to come back in its final form in December that we have to then officially approve, right? Correct. Yeah. So unless members, and I know, I think the controller had maybe some changes or, or comments or modifications. No, maybe we should bring those up now. Uh, actually, if we're just talking about Section 7, Part A, I'm fine with that. Okay. The changes. Yeah. Uh, this is Member, Member Gaines, Gaines? Uh, through the chair. Uh, Mr. Nanjo, um, yes, it looks sir. like uh, everything, not everything, at least what I'm reading at, at this point, is that the what's being expressed in the purple ink is all is basically clarification and then backing up with backing that up with government code. Yes, and as, as I understand the will of the board, the government code is not going to be in the final document. It's more of a reference so people know where um, those changes are coming from. Okay. All right. I mean, Let's I think see. on, um, if I look, there's a couple provisions where uh, there's a specific um, description I think a good example is number 18, where it says in the middle of the paragraph um, adopted in accordance with government code section 15606 subdivision C, that's going to remain. But the, the ones that are more kind of almost like end notes, which appear at the end of the um, paragraph, those will be dropped out. And again, um, this will come back to the board in December. And if um, it's over edited or if people would like to add the um, citations back in, we can do that at that time. I'm comfortable with that unless the members have any comments or suggestions or concerns. If I could again. Member uh, Gaines, go ahead. Gaines, I, um, I just want to try to reach the right balance with the agreement and I mean, if we need government code to refer to that particular subject matter in that particular paragraph, I think there's value in that. So I don't want to, I don't want to par it down too much. I want to make sure that uh, it's clear enough. And if you have a question uh, and there's government code listed, then you can go to the code and get clarity. Thank you. Okay. And, and it is the board's preference whether I leave the government code references in or we can even put them in as a footnote in some cases, whatever the board's desire is, I'm more than happy to adjust the document accordingly. And I know there's a, a pre I, I guess people have different preferences. I've heard from some folks that they like the footnote versus, you know, the actual governance reference. Uh, I kind of like the footnote, but I don't know what everybody else thinks. Uh, Chair Vasquez, this is yes, Vice, Vice Chair Schaefer. Um, I don't look forward to revisiting all of this next month either. It seems to be an awful lot of att executive attention over some very minor issues, uh, very little substantive, 100% procedure. Uh, uh, I would say we're trying to milk mice. And uh, I would support uh, disposing of it now if we can. Uh, I think it's been discussed uh, time and time again before, and uh, I'm surprised that they really need our, our uh, vote to change the word uh, government to governance and a few things like that. I think that just is common sense, but if our approval is required. I'm ready to give it right now and save uh, the blood, sweat and tears for more important issues. Mr. Chairman. Yes, um, Madam Controller, go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, I, I would agree that by and large the changes are fine. Um, I'm not, um, I don't really have a preference with respect to whether we use footnotes or parenthetical reference citations. I do think to Mr. Nanjo's point, there are some code citations within the body of the policy that 
probably should appropriately remain in the body of the policy. And I would defer to legal on that. Um, I am going to just say uh, I'm not prepared to um, support this yet. Um, there are some further conversations I'd like to have uh, with Mr. Nanjo and his team with respect to, um, I think, further clarifying um, Section 4 on the tax programs and the uh, wording of uh, of the um, authority vested in us to hear tax appeals. I think there's a way to state that a little bit more in a streamlined way. And rather trying to wordsmith it here publicly, I think uh, just having him bring back a version would be great. We could all see it up on a screen. Um, and then uh, lastly, in Section 7, Part B, um, there was a government code citation as well as uh, uh, California Constitutional, Art uh, Constitutional Article 1, Section 3, where um, I just wanted to understand um, the language that's being added, um, how that comports with both of those uh, reference citations. So um, not for a conversation here, but happy to work with Mr. Danjo and his staff just to understand that better. Understood. Thank you. Thank you for Thank those you. comments. Uh, anybody else? If I could, just to remember gains, go ahead. clarity, and, and maybe it's going to happen in the, the final edition of this. I know it's a draft, but if we could, because uh, we have Roman numerals for each section, but uh, I'm hoping that we'll have page references too. So if you're going to section eight, eight you know what page that starts on and where it ends. Good point. Hearing no, nobody else, uh, Mr. Ninja, you want to go keep going? Sure. Thank you, Chairman Vasquez. Um, the next section is uh, the two sections that uh, Controller Yi kind of, or at least one section that Controller Yi um, mentioned, uh, which is um, regarding agency staff and budget change proposals. Um, there were some suggested language there. Uh, this is uh, on my page 12. It's section Roman numeral seven, again, under roles and powers of the board regarding agency staff and budget change proposals. I'll work, um, and then also actually D, legislative analysis. Um, I, I can um, work with controller's office uh, to address any uh, concerns that she has um, or her office has and bring that back. Um, later on in that sec same section uh, under uh, letter G, there's, again, more what I would consider um, um, grammar clarification, which is fine. That's in the red. Section Roman numeral eight regarding role of board chair and vice chair, we've already addressed. Um, and under the next section I have is on page 15 under Roman numeral nine. Um, there was language added. Um, regarding um, inspection of work of any, uh, the language that was added or edited is, however, upon a motion approved by the board in open session, board members may individually or collectively inspect the work of any local officers whose duties relate to the assessment of property as authorized by government code sections 15612, 15611, and 15613. Um, Then under that, under uh, Roman numeral 9A, governing style, uh, the addition and the executive director was added. Um, and then there were some additional changes under uh, board member competencies. Um, and on um, in that same section, C, questions on agenda items, there was additional language that um, re questions at meetings regarding specific agenda items uh, could be addressed to the executive director or to any person designated on the agenda or introduced to speak at the meeting. It's a pretty straightforward change. Um, and then after that, um, there was on page 17, this is on uh, Communications with third parties, section D. Um, there was language added as to defining what an adjudicatory proceeding is to which the ex parte uh, 
prohibition applies. Again, um, this is a recitation of law, so this is pretty straightforward. Um, and then uh, there was a recommendation under communication with ED's designated staff for uh, communication protocols to be developed. And then uh, the next change I have is under uh, letter G was under civility and courtesy was crossed out as being redundant, uh, least stated in section nine, paragraph A. Um, there was a code citation added to confidentiality. And then under um, Roman numeral 10, the role of the executive director, um, there was a addition uh, referring to the resolution of conferring powers to the executive director. Um, so those would be the changes that were um, suggested by various uh, persons, various board members regarding the governor's policy. Any thoughts or comments? Chairman Vasquez, back, back to you. Yes. Any thoughts or comments by any of the members on this? Mr. Chairman, just a comment. Um, I want yes. to thank Mr. Nanto and his staff for um, just the diligence in uh, reviewing these policies and certainly incorporating all of our input in this. I think it's uh, actually shaping up to be one darn good policy. So um, happy about that. Um, and we'll follow up with the specific issues that I had um, uh, prior to the next meeting. I just had a question, and uh, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to hop off uh, shortly. And that is, um, with respect to the uh, action that we took today about the uh, chair and vice chair, um, to the extent that that's going to get incorporated as the policy in terms of the role of the chair and vice chair in the actual process for electing them, um, since the policy has not been adopted, it, does that action stand alone with respect to being able to proceed without the adoption of the governance policy? A uh, question to Mr. Nanjo. Yes, my understanding is that was a properly um, held motion, approved motion of the board. So we will proceed along those lines and we will add the language in the governance policy um, to be consistent with that. But um, that is a standalone um, decision of this board. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to uh, actually pass the baton to Ms. Stowers and really appreciate the indulgence of uh, uh, my colleagues here uh, based on my schedule. Um, so thank you. It's good to see all of you. No, thank you. Thank you for your time. And we look forward to seeing you again. Good. Yeah, thank you. you. Take care. Take, take care. <clears throat> Welcome, Ms. Stowers. Deputy Cola Stowers here. <laughs> All right. Well, it's nice to have a tag team. I wish I could have a tag team, you know. <laughs> well, right, I'm Mr. back. Knight. I will mute my my mic now. All right. Thank you, Controller Yi. Mr. Nanjo, you're on again. So that will complete the review of the governor's policy based upon the comments of the board members and the direction we, I've received. I will try to implement those changes and have a draft for the board's review at the December meeting. In the meantime, um, I will make every endeavor to meet with uh, controller Yee's and or her staff uh, to address any of the changes she made. And I will be prepared in the December meeting to uh, call out any um, modifications that may have been made at her request. Great. And and to kind of follow the, the line or the suggestion or the comment by uh, Vice Chair Schaefer, uh, we should all take a moment, you know, once this is done by Nanjo and our staff, to take a look at it before the meeting. So when it comes before us in December, we don't have to labor over it too much other than just, you know, maybe there might be some fine tuning, but it shouldn't be anything major that we need to go through every item that was adjusted. And with that, I'll ask Ms. Best, Taylor. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, any other comments? Just a comment of clarification as to member gains. Member gains, go ahead. I, I heard it mentioned by a couple members, but just wanted to make sure that uh, we were clear on the uh, footnoting of government code throughout it. I think I think we are in agreement on that, but just uh, wanted to double double check. Yeah, I was suggesting that we footnote it and it sounds like uh, uh, 
Madam Controller, who just stepped out, she didn't seem to have a preference either way. And unless I'm hearing from others, we will go ahead and just footnote them. That's what you're requesting, Member Gaines? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I'm not hearing any objections. Thank you for that clarification. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Nunger. No, no. I was, I was uh, ask, thanking uh, Member Gaines and yourself, uh, Chairman Vasquez, for that clarification. I will um, obviously um, move those things uh, as appropriate into footnotes. And, um, you know, when we get together in December, if the board decides that they don't like the look of that, we can always change it back. Not a problem. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes, Madam Sowers, go ahead. Yes, yeah, just going back to what Controller Yee was saying, I'm just wondering if it's possible that once we have the draft document, if we could put it up on a split screen, um, either That's as right. a Word she document did. or a PowerPoint, so that um, we can all follow along. I'm That's sure a good point. Our, our technology people could handle that for us. Is staff able to do that? So, uh, Chairman Vasquez, this is Henry Nanjo, uh, Chief Counsel. That's beyond my skill set. So I will work with Executive Director Fleming and our technology department to see what we can accomplish along those lines. Appreciate so, it. So good afternoon, members. Yes, uh, using the using this technology platform, we are able to share screens. We'll do a test drive with you prior to the meeting. And uh, for someone that, re that has reading glasses, um, if we could just clarify that that print would be large enough that we could follow along during the hearing. Thank you. Yeah, that is going to be. Thank you, Member That's Gaines. That is going to be one of the one of the challenges because the text is typically on a shared screen a bit smaller. Um, but we'll do some test driving of it first, just to see how it looks. Um, the, the the feature is there, so we can share a screen. Um, the ease of reading might be a little bit of a challenge, but we'll double check it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate members. that member gains because I have the same problem. <laughs> with that, Ms. Taylor, I think we're done with this item, right? Yes. And I believe the final item for today is in public comment on matters not on the agenda. We have received a public comment form. We have two public comments, written comments, and then we'll move to the online comments. The first comment is from Justin Aldi. Our firm has concerns regarding the legality of Prop 19 appearing on the November 3rd, 2020 ballot as it violates the California's Constitution, Article 2, Section 8D, which states an initiative measure embracing more than one subject may not be submitted to the electors or have any effect. We believe your agency should be taking proactive steps to file suit against the Secretary of State for violating the Constitution. Our second written comment today is from Kent Meyer. Good day, board members and controller Yee. Our firm represents taxpayers regarding property tax issues. We advised our clients to vote no on Proposition 19 on the November 3rd, 2020 ballot. It was our opinion at the time that the proposition was unconstitutional due to the misleading naming convention and the convoluted multi-issue components of the measure. We believe the measure itself is illegal and should not have been allowed on the ballot pursuant to California Constitution Article 2, Section 8D, which states, an initiative measure embracing more than one subject may not be submitted to the electors or have any effect. Proposition 19 address issues covered under, but not limited to, Revenue and Taxation Code Sections 63.1, 69.3, and 69.5. The modifications addressed in Proposition 19 were approved by voters in separate ballot initiatives in the 1980s and the 1990s. This one ballot measure modified at least four separate ballot measures previously approved. While certain sections of Prop 19 do provide for additional relief to senior citizens, disabled citizens, and victims of fire damage, it also removes some previous protections from increased supplemental taxes to heirs after their parents' death. 
It also does not take into consideration the reason some counties do not participate in the program that allows for base value transfers from one county to another. Smaller counties are at a large disadvantage regarding services and revenues provided to owners that sell small yet potentially very valuable homes in certain areas of the state and transferring low base values along with construction credits to the smaller counties. This proposition creates a major disadvantage and financial burden to those counties regarding fees and services. If the authors of this bill were truly taking into consideration additional tax relief and benefits to seniors, disabled persons, and fire victims, they should have addressed each of them in a separate ballot initiative rather than attacking and dismembering the benefits of the parent to child and grandparent to grandchild exclusions hidden behind those benefits. We believe the BOE should be filing suit against the Secretary of State for violating the Constitution by allowing the measure to move forward on the November 3rd, 2020 ballot. We look forward to your response and action. At this time, the AT&T moderator, can you please let us know if there's anyone on the line who would like to make a public comment regarding this matter at this time? As a reminder, if you'd like to queue up for public comment at this time, please press one then zero on your telephone keypad. I'm not showing anyone placing themselves in the queue at this time. All right. Chairman Vasquez? Yes, okay. <clears throat> Before we, um, we're actually not gonna adjourn, but we're gonna take a recess until tomorrow. But before we do, you know, as I was going back over my notes, I just wanted to make sure we're all clear on this. And I guess, uh, Maybe it's a question for uh, Ms. Stowers and Ms. Cohen. You know, earlier when we were discussing uh, the Prop 19 and the action that you'd be moving forward with, uh, I guess I'd like to hear from you uh, what you think or what you um, understood as your role moving forward with that specific issue or what you're empowered to do, I guess I should say. Um, I don't think necessarily it's, it's an assertion of power. It's just work needs to be done. And I'm interested in doing the work, holding meetings. Uh, we've reached out already to um, Senate and Assembly leadership. Uh, we've had previous conversations. We had started, this was back in August. I took my leave on, on, um, on the subject on the subject matter. So I, I'm not quite sure, um, uh, you know, your question. I mean, there's I'm I just volunteering I, to do some work. I guess where I'm a little confused, because in thinking back, and, and maybe I should ask uh, Brenda or staff on this, is that uh, it's my understanding, and I know many of us raise this issue. I think we're all pretty much, or, or several of us, are in the dark in, in terms of what Prop 19 actually means. And we're all, we need to gather that information. And I'm a little concerned and worried that we start taking off, especially with the legislators, for example, on a position that we personally haven't even discussed publicly among ourselves. Because I know it was, I think it was Member Gaines earlier mentioned, you know, uh, he raised some issues and I have some concerns about Prop 19, but even in talking to staff and to Mr. Gakel, nobody seems to have those answers right now. And well, I'm Mr. wondering Chair, if it isn't a, if it isn't more appropriate, more on a profit on a process issue, if it isn't more appropriate, because I know staff is working diligently to gather that information and legal is trying to put that all together and then bring it back to us and then have us decide what's our next steps or our next actions, I guess. Because that's my question. I'm a little afraid that, you know, we have staff on the one hand doing the legal research and putting all the facts together. And then to a certain extent, we would have you and Ms. Dowers running to the legislators talking about, you know, how we need to uh, 
come up with some cleanup language, but I don't think we all know what that cleanup language is going to be. Agreed. So we are not running back to legislators doing anything or taking oh, okay. any That's action on behalf of the board. As a matter of fact, I mean, what we're doing is the legwork and gathering the information. Quite honestly, we've the, the Prop 19 has already set sail. And I tried to initiate a lot of these conversations prior to my leave, but we had a full agenda and just wasn't fully successful. Um, there have been hearings. Um, the Assessors Association took a hearing. And I think that Prop 19 is pretty clear. What is unclear is how it will be implemented. And um, from what I understand, legislation um, like this has been passed and it has been passed by voters in the past during the past election cycles and cleanup or trailer legislation to clarify the implementation of the legislation comes second. It's not the best way to do not the best way to do policy. I would agree with that. But, um, you know, I, I hope I've answered your question. I'm not I don't really fully understand your question, but I believe that answer should suffice. Well, I, I guess my question is to uh, part of it is to staff, and I'm wondering what you're talking about, since you're now. I think you one you've stated that you're obviously not going to go run to the legislators, but in your in the in the fact finding that you're doing now, how is that different from what I guess staff is doing already? I guess is my question. Well, the the role is is that things should not be delegated just to staff. I think that it needs to be a complementary approach. It needs to be board member presence. It needs to be staff presence. It needs to be um, the assessors association presence. This is a collective effort, and I think that it would be remiss upon our own duties to just let staff do the job and then come back and report to us. I think that we should have a little bit more of a proactive approach and strategy as we move forward um, to move this to move this. Um, to work with the, to work with the implementation of the legislation, we are elected duly members of the California State Board of Equalization. It is our job, is in our prayer view, purview to to handle you know tax property tax measures and issues. So I think that we need to take a forward proactive approach in the um, reconciliation of the of of the legislation as it relates to the implementation of it for the entire state of California. I agree. I, I guess my only concern is that, you know, and I know you've been a big champion of this, you know, the whole transparency issue, and I just don't want us to get out in front of something that we're not fully venting or vetting or discussing among the board members first. That's that's my only concern. And I'm wondering if we maybe shouldn't wait until, you know, I guess we have a couple of weeks. Well, you know, I guess the holidays are going to hit us. We got Thanksgiving already on us, so it doesn't give us a whole lot of time. But at least between now and our next meeting, allowing uh, Brenda and her team to come back and report to us what they've gathered and what they've come up with. And then at that point, come up with maybe a strategic plan of where do we go from here? And it could be maybe just putting together a, a letter. From uh, we've already agreed that Ms. Fleming will keep us posted. Which, where are your reservations? Like what if you, earlier in the meeting, you were OK with this. And now towards the end of the meeting, you're not like what's. I'm, I'm a little confused, I guess, and maybe. Could I weigh in? Let me, let me ask other members. Maybe time. it's only me. Member Gaines, go ahead. If I get this weigh in, um, I'm just I'm I'm wondering if um, does it make sense to have a two-step process? One would be uh, gathering of information uh, by staff that, uh, in a very timely manner, uh, could then be presented, and then step two would be engagement with the legislature uh, by member Cohen and member Stowers. Because in a sense, we don't know what we don't know. And so my my thinking is if we had, if we could have them do some research and look at these areas uh, that are gonna be friction points that are gonna have to be resolved in working with the legislature, or perhaps in some of these cases, uh, we might be able to resolve them ourselves with our own, own rulemaking authority. That's it. <laughs> uh, no, Ms. Stowers, go ahead. I'm sorry. I think you're wanting you to weigh in. Thank you. I think everyone made some really good points. I, 
I volunteered for the assignment because I was looking forward to one working with Member Cohen, and two, um, I wanted to help um, identifying some of the um, concerns for implementing this new law. Um, I don't know for how many years now I've, I've sat on the Board of Equalization and heard tax appeals on various laws that was just so flawed and it was all because of the implementation. So I really wanted to have my hand in it so that we can correct some problems up front. Um, I was also looking at working with BOE staff because they are currently working on the issue and they have the expertise and I never want to take away um, the, the valuable work the staff does, our, our, our assessors. Um, the issue that I'm having right now is that whatever we do, we do need to report back to the entire board and keep the entire board informed. And we need to work quickly. And I'm concerned that if we're reporting back to the board, if we do run into violating Bagley King, and none of us wants to violate Bagley King. So I actually like um, Member Gaines' proposal, the two-step two proposal with some modifications. I like the idea of going back to staff and have them do the legwork on the issues that need to be developed. And then from there, um, as a board, we could decide if we need to um, sponsor legislation to correct some of the issues with Prop 19. And if we sponsor such legislation, um, the members will individually or as a board reach out to different people to author the legislation. But I don't think we're going to have a problem with getting author. And then, of course, um, our staff working with um, staff on the uh, on Capitol would draft that legislation. And then maybe we like, um, well, I really appreciate what my member Gaines said, maybe we don't need legislation. Maybe we could work out these issues through a property tax rule. That's completely within our, and our, our, that's, that's what we do. So we could, you know, work it out through that way. And, and start the interested parties process and get all stakeholders involved. No, that's helpful. Let, let me ask uh, staff, uh, is Brenda, is Ms. Fleming available there? Good afternoon, yes, sir. So uh, thank you ask, for the conversation. Uh, I'm sorry, I just want ahead. to ask you a quick question. As you're hearing the discussion, is there any gap in, or and some of the things that maybe, that I know you and staff is already working on this, is, are there some gaps that maybe uh, we could have, uh, whether it's uh, the team of Ms. Towers and Ms. Cohen or just the board that could help and assist to try to move this a little bit faster? Because I know, you know, it seems like we're all kind of on pins and needles because, you know, we're just worried about this thing coming, you know, February coming so close on us that we're prepared for it. That's all. So if, I, if I'm understanding it correctly, so so to back up just a bit, if I may, um, we are in the process and have been working on identifying the gaps and the implementation issues and challenges. I think it would be a benefit to allow us to get a little further through that work, um, and, and we will work uh, timely as we possibly can on that one to get something. And that would be helpful for everyone to have at least some of that some of that material. Um, I appreciate what the discussion was in terms of really what the process is. Um, so from a staff perspective, what we're prepared to do, and I've already um, started some of this work beyond creating the document that clarifies the issues, is to reach out with the legislative staff. Where I make the distinction is where the, our board, you as members of the board, are working with the legislators directly. So I think we do have, you know, from my perspective, a two-tier approach as to how we can proceed. Uh, certainly would be helpful to have us have the material so that, you know, so that we're consistent. Um, and then you can use that material as reference material as you're having conversations with the legislature um, and really just try to move it forward. One of the other issues that we could consider, and if this is, you know, the board's pleasure, if you want to start with even written communications in the form of letters, uh, to the legislature to just inform them of, you know, of what we are planning to do, not revealing all of the detail, but our intent to to jump in on this one and, and take a leadership role to make sure that the legislation is clear and so that we can do our best to optimize it. 
Um, so there's a number of different approaches. I think the key is going to be just, I think, as it was alluded to, we don't want to have any bagley keen issues where, um, you know, where I'm, I'm constrained. I want to make sure that all members are informed. So whichever way we can proceed, that allows you to engage, you know, as members with legislators and then allows us to work with staff. Then as we're getting our information um, for us to be able to come back as staff and report back to the board what our findings are. And then really then working through the process as to how we consolidate all that information. Um, I, I think I heard mention of an IP process on this. If I could just make a comment there, the IP process may be definitely something that we could use longer term as it relates to, you know, you know, promulgating rules, et cetera. But of course, the IP process is a little longer. If we are, in fact, trying to achieve something before the February 16th operative date, then the IP process um, would probably not be the best, uh, best forum to address that, at least for now. So it really is the pleasure of the board if you if you want to give us you know a little time to just at least document more of our material so we could provide you more clarity. Um, but again, I don't also I don't want to interfere with members, you as elected constitutional officers uh, interacting with your colleagues in the legislature. Just want to make sure that we're all aligned and and you know and on the same page as we're moving forward. So, sir, I'm not sure if that answered your questions or those comments were of value. No, I think you did. And and now and, and then listening to the conversation both from uh, Ms. Stowers and Ms. Cohen and then Member Gaines, uh, I'm wondering if it if it wouldn't be appropriate to uh, for us to wait and give staff I guess that opportunity to come back with us back to us with their findings before we uh, get I, ahead of ourselves. I don't I, I don't know how they're this is Member Gaines. Can I take a stab at a motion here and see if sure, we can go ahead. clarity? And that would be that uh, we as the board would ask that staff um, analyze Prop 19 and uh, provide advice to the board working in coordination with the Assessors Association. Upon receipt of that information, uh, we would have members Cohen and Stowers explore options, whether it's rulemaking, whether it's legislation, uh, in terms of where we would go as a board. Of course, other members would have that opportunity too, but they have volunteered. So I want to honor their willingness to uh, help lead this effort. I would second that, Vice Chair Schaefer. Okay, so it's a moved and second. Uh, so if I'm hearing correctly the motion, so at this point, uh, we're going to give staff, Brenda and the staff, the opportunity to come back to us before we take any action with Ms. Stowers and Ms. Cohen. Is that correct? Yeah, my, if you're, is that to me, that question? Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I, yeah, I would like to get the information gathered so we have clarity. I'm good terms, with that. Yeah, where are the areas that need to be fixed? And that would be uh, outreach and communication with the assessors uh, board uh, that could then be brought back to us as members and then the second step would be uh, inner you know action what, what will we do with the legislature what will we do internally in terms of rulemaking and I I'd be relying on uh, member Stowers and Cohen uh, to lead that effort sure uh, chairman Vasquez this is uh, chief counsel Henry Manjo Yes. Um, I just wanted to try to clean up our record a little bit. If I remember correctly, the first item um, where we discussed the uh, potential group of um, deputy controller Stowers and member Cohen um, wasn't really um, discussed as a motion. It was more of a directive. Um, as I understand what we're doing now, even though um, a motion was made, because this isn't agendized, um, I, I believe the better process is just to amend your prior directive along the lines that um, Member Gaines is suggesting. Understood. Are, is the maker and the second of the motion okay with that? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Member Schaefer. Thank you, gentlemen and board members. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we don't get ahead of ourselves before we give staff that opportunity to to come back with this information that they're already moving forward on. That's all. And if it takes just, I guess, to redirect the direction that we gave, I'm good with that. Mr. Chairman? Yes. This is Ms. Taylor. Yes. 
See the word origin there? Yes, I'm. Miss Taylor? I don't understand it. It'd be yes. Oh, oh uh, Mr. Schaefer, yes. you might want to mute your mic. Ms. Taylor? Yes, uh, we would like to go back to the at and moderator and open up the public comment line in order to ensure that all members of the public had an opportunity to speak. Is that all right with you? Before we do that, though, before we leave this item that we were just finishing up, I, I was, mm -hmm. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to see if there was uh, interest or support, I guess, from the board at this point. Maybe we shouldn't, we should at least draft the letter though. I'm wondering if there's a consensus from the board to draft a letter that would go to the leadership of the legislators, letting them know that we're very concerned about the impacts of Prop 19 and that we're working on some uh, cleanup language. And uh, we hope that there'll be support for that moving forward. And this I, way we can get this out. I, I'm just, I would like to get this out before they, you know, because they're going to come together on December 7th. Yep. And I'm thinking we won't meet until after. So I'm thinking if we do something, it doesn't have to be real specific, but at least so they understand and they hear from us as a board that we're very concerned about this. And yep. we, we want them to uh, hopefully wait for us to reconvene and then give them some, hopefully, uh, some suggestions and some concerns that we're hearing from our folks. Yeah, this is member gains. I'm I'm comfortable with that. I think it'd be wise um, just to let them know that we're you know aware of the issues and the challenges uh, with regard to Prop 19, and we want to be proactive. Yeah, uh, this is uh, Chair Schaefer. I I would agree with you on that. Uh, uh, Chair Vasquez, they've had a lot of bad publicity from the BOE over the recent years, and I think this would be a very positive image for us to be sending over to them of what our concerns and action are. Great, so if, if people are okay, let me, I'll get my staff to work on a draft and then float it by everybody. And if there's a consensus or, or an agreement from the board, we'll go ahead and send that off and we'll get that out before December 7th. Are people comfortable with that? Ms. Dowers, you good? Yes. Okay. So we will go ahead and do that. Thank you. I just wanted to get that before we close out. Ms. Taylor. Uh, uh, Vasquez. Oh, I'm sorry, Member Gaines. If I could ask another question related to some of the public comment uh, with regard to Prop 19 and whether it's constitutional or not with regard to more than one subject addressed within a ballot measure. Is that something that we could, I, it would, I would like to have our legal department uh, take a look at this and, and um, do a little research and give us an update in, in, on the status of that. This is the first I've heard of this. So I think it'd be useful for the board uh, to know where we stand on this proposition so, um, Member Gaines, this is uh, Chief Counsel Henry Nanjo. That came up as an end item. It was not agendized, so it wouldn't be appropriate to discuss it at this meeting. But we have looked into the issue. We will provide uh, um, some information to the board either at the next board meeting or, or in the interim. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. With that, Ms. Taylor, uh, we can go back now. We can go to at and Excellent, thank you. AT&T moderator, can you please let us know if there is anyone on the line who would like to make a public comment regarding this matter at this time? If you would like to queue up to give public comment, please press one then zero at this time on your telephone keypad. And we do not have anyone queuing up at this time. Thank you. And board members, just to clarify regarding the letter, um, we will uh, the letter will be uh, drafted uh, by the chair's office and we'll uh, collect feedback through board proceedings division as is usually the case um, 
in our normal process that that will make sure that we're uh, staying uh, in accordance with Bagley Keene issues. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Taylor, hearing nothing from uh, AT&T, we don't have any written comments that we need to read into the record, do we? Uh, I previously read them, so we're good. That's it? Okay, we're good. So with that, members, um, we are not adjourning this meeting, but rather just taking a recess and we'll reconvene tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. There's no other items, right, Ms. Taylor? That is correct. Okay. Because that's all I have on my agenda here. And we'll just reconvene tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. And we're hoping uh, yeah. Member Cohen could join us tomorrow, but I know she's got other commitments. You didn't send her my photo. My photo for Tony. Take care. All right. Thank you. We'll see everybody tomorrow. We'll see you all tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, members. Thank you, staff.